So, okay, we are recording. Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to tonight's webinar. It's all about how to uh, mark your, uh, or mark a driving test. And um, with me tonight, I'm going to introduce you in a moment. I'm, I'm, I'm with uh, who I affectionately call Nick the Greek, because I can't pronounce his surname. And uh, I'm also with Martin Leather as well. Martin's arranged all of this. So, there's a few little bits that I want to do before I bring Martin and Nick into this. So first of all, a bit of housekeeping. If the fire alarm goes off, I don't have one. So I suggest you pack up your laptop and call the police. or call, call, call the fire alarm very quickly. And if you need the toilet, hopefully you know where they are because it's your place. Anyway, tonight is um, brought to you by the Driving Instructors Business Summit. We have a summit on January the 28th. I want all ADIs uh, to go to that because it's not like your, your standard conference. You're actually going to learn something. No disrespect to anybody else that does conferences, but it's just a fantastic event and Martin's going to be speaking there as well. Um, so the Driving Instructors Business Summit um, donates all the money, so all the trade stands, and uh, all the ticket sales to a fantastic charity called Speed of Sight. Uh, they're a blind driving school. We'll touch up on them a little bit later and uh, their project called Pass a Pound. And this is being recorded live uh, tonight onto Vision. For everybody who is watching this right now as a registrant, you will receive a copy of this tomorrow in your email inbox. But we can only do this thanks to Tina and Kelly down at AD and D who are funding the webinars. So thank you to those. And uh, good evening, Martin and Nick. Good evening, David. <clears throat> right, I'd like to introduce um, Nick. I can pronounce his surname, Nicolau, correct? Yeah. Um, now, this evening, Nick's going to be answering a lot of questions, uh, but he's not here in any official capacity. And anything he says tonight is his own personal opinion and it's not DVSA policy in any way, shape or form. And I'd like to just say that we'll try and answer all the questions that you come up with, but Nick can't answer any specifics, like specific tests, specific test centres or specific exams. Um, it's just really to answer, in his opinion, how certain things should be marked on the DL25 driving test report. Which is all about getting the full license absolutely and how you can replicate that for a mock test yep um nick's very kindly given up a lot of his time for this he's met with me quite a few times um for us to discuss this and get it sorted and he's doing this completely um out of the goodness of his heart to support the speed of sight pass a pound scheme which i am not going to pass up the opportunity to mention now Little plug, guys, pass a pound, okay. Speed of sight, pass a pound. We want everybody to register for that. If you do register for a pass a pound and send me an email at martin at drivingschooldevelopment.co.uk, you will receive a CPD certificate. So please do. Um, Just Nick, quickly on pass a pound, what happens yes. is, once your pupil has passed the driving test, if you or your pupil donate a pound once they pass their driving test, sit to speed of sight, goes directly to their charity. And what their charity does, or what, what um, uh, actually, well, I can't get my words out. <laughs> what, their, what their charity does is this. They've got off-road and um, track cars as well. They're custom-built, dual controls. I'm talking two steering wheels. And when I say a blind driving school, Mike Newman, uh, the founder, is blind, is a world record holder. And what the charity does, it helps people to have the experience of driving who, who would never have the possibility of doing so. So it's either people that have been maybe disabled through birth or maybe through life. So if it's something like maybe cerebral palsy, um, Down syndrome, blind, um, or have you know, or have you not? Um, then that charity gets those people in the cars and you know it really really changes lives in a positive way um, the Instructors Business Summit has been supporting them for what would be three years in January um, so Martin's a massive advocate of this as am I so if you do want a CPD certificate tonight 
there are 565 registrants. All we want you to do, if you want a CBD certificate tonight, you sign up for pass a pound yeah. and um, uh, we'll show you how later on. And then you just inform Martin that you sign up for pass a pound. Inform Martin on his email address and we'll give you full details later as well. Um, I'll write them down and um, if Martin reminds me, I'll pop them in an email to you and then Martin will sort out CPD. Um, so before I let you two take over, uh, Derek um, from Western Australia said good morning from Australia. Good morning, Derek. Good morning, Derek. Good morning. Here we go, around the world, aren't we? Come well, on then, let's crack on, Nick. Where do you want to start? Right, okay. Um, I'm going to start off by asking Nick a few questions, um, just generic questions relating to the DL25 form. So we're going to start off with that. Nick, can you let everybody who is watching know how many different types of driver ports there are? Well, there's your um, non-worthy one. Can you okay. speak up a bit, please? Speak up a bit, please, Nick. Non, non-worthy, in other words, it is a port, but it's not worthy of, of putting down on the 25. And then there is the one that is worthy, then you've got serious, and then you've got dangerous. So three? Three different types? Three, di- uh, yeah, three different types, but the, the, the first one, we don't, we don't put it down. Right. Okay. Can you give me an example of that then? Because I don't understand. You're saying it's a failure, but it's not worth it putting it down. No, no, it's not a failure. It's not a failure. It's a, it's a fault, but in the examiner's mind, it's not worth marking it down on the paper. Perhaps Nick, you can explain you need, that a bit more. You need 15, uh, 16 driver faults or more to fail. So if you get 15 driver faults, you can still pass. Yeah. But it's non-worthy, it is, uh, for an example, is, um, I don't know, it, it, like a steering fault. Uh, it just wobbled. Yeah, it wasn't the right thing to do, but okay. did, did anything really happen? No. Or like a, a gear fault. Uh, it missed the gear, but you put it back in. Not worthy of a fault. Uh, okay. whereas, uh, uh, whereas if you kept it in, say, fourth in, uh, instead of second, and the car was rumbling a little bit, and it started affecting the speed of the car, then it becomes a driver fault. And then from there, it, it becomes a serious fault. If it rumbles, rumbles, rumbles to a, a stall in the middle of a main road, then it becomes serious because now cars are trying to uh, dart out of its way to avoid hitting it. Okay, yeah. brilliant. Okay. That, that kind of leads me into the next thing we were going to talk about. Mm-hmm. How do examiners weigh up a fault. How do you guys decide whether it should be a driver fault, a serious fault, a dang- or a dangerous fault? Okay, so a driver fault, uh, uh, if you don't say check your mirror after, you know, before indicating, then okay. that's a fault. Or, for example, a steering fault, he's turned right, he's swan neck, the car's gone out the middle of the road he's going into. So, okay, that's, uh, that's a driver fault. Okay. Yeah. Nobody was affected. The car didn't go exactly where it should have gone. A serious fault, same right turn. Yeah. But now he's gone well over. It says so turn right and he's gone, uh, instead of staying on, straightening up, he's swung neck and he's on the wrong side of the road. And, and he's gone there for a considerable time. Right. Uh, the same on the left turn, so you miss your point of turn, now you're completely on the wrong side of the road. Not just a little bit, but completely. And especially if it's a blind junction, you think, well, that was lucky, okay. but not so lucky for the guy or the girl because it isn't here at all. Right. Dangerous is when it's uh, when there's someone there and you've had to take action to avoid it. So you do stand on the brakes or, or grab the steering wheel to avoid mm-hmm hitting them or hitting the uh, uh, public station. So just to, to clarify that, if they were to um, swan neck with nobody mm-hmm. there, that would yeah. be a driver fault. If they were to swan neck and yeah. there was somebody with there... Part, a part of the car over, not, not considerably. If it's the whole car's over and they've lost a, a complete control in there, so they can see it in their faces and they go, whoa, 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 like that. Then that, that is a serious yeah. fault. If, it, if a foot or two goes over, then it's not so serious, unless, of course, there's someone there. And that's where the luck aspect comes in, you know, because 
uh, sometimes you're not allowed to stray off the line at all because the, the road is narrow. Yep. Or Absolutely. But if the road is wide and nobody's there and they go over by a little bit, as a driving tool. They go completely over and they and they, and they have show no signs of, of, of sorting it out, uh, then that's a serious fault. Or, of course, if you've got um, a series of driver faults, for, say, for example, left turn, they keep missing their steering point and they're going over, they're swiping over that. Actually. It's not completely on the wrong side of the road, but they continually do it, then something's wrong. So it becomes a serious fault. Okay. A dangerous fault is when uh, uh, actual danger is there. So, in other words, you've, uh, you've had to break or steer or say something to avoid tripping something. Right, okay. Um, everybody that's watching, I hope that answered what a lot of the questions of that is going to be about. But if it hasn't answered it to your satisfaction, please put it in the chat box and David will bring it back up a little can bit. I, can I jump in with a question from here now? We'll try yeah. to do ones that you've got or ones that I've got because yeah. I know that people have taken the time to write a question. I'd like to try and get to them if we can. Um, so, Peter Sleet, evening Peter, show me, tell me, is it possible to fail at that point? Um, it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be. Um, the, I, I have actually failed someone uh, early days uh, of doing that, but uh, it was... Um, it was like, show me how you would uh, check the engine cooler for the wire. We had a steaming hot engine, and the guy um, sort of pointed to it, and said, I'd open that. And as he said that, he actually went to, he pushed it down to open the, the thing. And I've had to take action by putting my hand over his, yeah. and his hand now turning, <laughs> at least his face didn't turn, because at the moment he tried yeah. to twist it, and I had to take action to avoid him getting a scoggy face. I've got a bit of a follow-up question to that. Um, and this is asked by Ari Ahmed. Ari, I, I hope I've pronounced your, um, your first name right. And he says, and, and this, you can see where I'm bringing the two together here. Ari says, is the examiner allowed to terminate the test if the person doesn't understand English? So can you see where that's coming in for maybe yeah. from the, um, the show we tell me? Yeah. Uh... Hmm. I can see where you're coming from, but personally, what I would do is, is if the person's English is not his first language, I'd, I'd choose, I'd choose um, appropriate questions. Um, I wouldn't want something where he has to explain too much, and it's more like, show me this. And you actually, after doing it a few years, you actually get to, you know, a feeling for what they, or what they mean. But you can. Uh, you can terminate it if, they, if you're not getting through. Um, if, they, if they continually don't understand and you can't do a meaningful test, then yes, you can terminate So what you're saying is then that what you would do is you would try to accommodate the, the learner as, as much as you possibly can in a fair and reasonable way. Yeah, you slow down with your English, your, your, you know, your saying, speaking slowly, your, your saying it clearly, your in pidgin English, basically, you're not, you know, saying it you know, as long as it should be, um, and you're getting, you're trying to get your point across. You're, you're using your hands, all sorts of things, to try and accommodate them. But if, if it's not working, um, and you once you're out on the road, you you won't terminate it there. You give them a chance and see how we get on, and then you say to them, you know, if you're out the driver, right? You can follow the road ahead, blah blah blah, and they go, yes, yes. So you think, oh, they've understood. And you go down the road and they completely don't know what you're talking about. And they keep looking at you as well. Uh, that's one so down they keep saying, yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. And they keep looking at you and they're not looking at the road. And you're trying to explain to them. Don't they? <laughs> and, you know, and they're still smiling and saying, yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, things are happening. And now I'm having to steal a car. And that, that's happened a few times. Not a lot of times. But, uh, you know, when you're having to sort of steer the car away because they're not looking at the road and they're looking at you, you can't fail them. You can't fail them for that because they genuinely just don't understand English and that's, their, uh, that's the only thing that's wrong. So yeah, I would terminate. I won't fail them. I'll just terminate it and then 
see where they go from there. Right. I'd like to jump in and um, with a little bit of a follow up about the show you tell me. Okay. Whilst you can't, like, you had that one example where you had to fail somebody because it was going to be dangerous. Um, whilst a candidate on the test will not normally fail all the questions per se, mm -hmm. they right. can definitely fail because they get the question wrong. Because I've sat in the back of enough tests to know that if they get the show me, tell me question wrong, they can get so flustered and the examiners normally give them you know, as many opportunities as possible to get it right. So, okay, no, that was actually a show me question, not tell me. Would you like to show me? And then, oh God, they panic. And then when they actually start the test, they're driving along and they're thinking about, oh, I got the question wrong, and they're and they're not in the right frame of mind for passing. I'm sure you've seen that a lot. Yeah, but normally when they're that bad, you know, like they, you know, they just don't have a clue of what what the answer is. I say, just don't worry, just don't worry, forget about it. And I've actually said you're not going to fail because of that. Then. Yeah. I've actually said that. The only you know, reason they, the other guy fell is because of, I thought that something happened as a consequence. I've had them open the door, you know, when they've gone to um, open the bonnet and then they, uh, with their bum sticking out in the traffic, and then they just open the door and the you know, car had to sw uh, swerve to avoid them, actually, you know, squeeze their brakes. Sounds stuff. like a scene from Benny Hill. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, it was that close that the, uh, the car had to reverse back so we can close that door because he, he, he got wedged right. You know, but While you're talking about doors and bonnets, Ari Ahmed has asked, are we allowed as instructors to help learners with show me, tell me questions? Example, if the person can't physically open the bonnet. Yes, as far as I know, yeah. yeah. Okay, cool, lovely. Well, well, I have got yeah. loads, loads and loads of questions. Exactly. Can you reiterate though, this is my, uh, what I do. All your personal, yeah, and yes. we have to keep on reiterating that as well. You should see the yes. questions coming yes. through. Yes. And, and I, can, I can jump in there and say for sure, because I've been in that situation, um, it is absolutely okay if you're accompanying the candidate on test to open the bonnet for them. I've done it several times with my rather short pupils. We can't do, it. Charge, do you charge a premium for that? I couldn't possibly say. Do you think I would, David? Honestly, no, I think you. I, I, I think you'd do it for nothing. Um, right. Okay. So well, I've got loads of questions. So do you mind if we try and focus on the questions that have been thrown in on here? Um, and, and by the way, everybody who's asking questions, um, if they're a little bit DVSA related, what Nick's going to try and do is going to try and make it personal related. But if Nick can't, we're going to politely decline the question because you know, Nick has been an examiner for a long time, you, you signed the Official Secrets Act, there's certain things you can do, and we are today just talking about the marking of it. Yeah. So if anybody refers to the DBSA, I will read it in that way, but Nick will then try and answer it from a personal point of view, so please respect yeah. that. I can't I've said that. Really I've got a question here from Graham Smith, mm -hmm. and Graham just put in six words, or <laughs> seven words. And he's, so you need to answer this as... as as succinctly as you can in return. Awareness and planning. Is this a dump box? No. There you go, yeah. Graham. <laughs> and yeah, please do make sure that you don't ask any specific um, DVSA questions because if Nick does ask them because he's signed the Official Secrets Act, he will have to come round and kill you. <laughs> yeah, we'll get James Bond coming around, yeah. Absolutely. Okay, so Julie Bunting. Julie Bunting, what will happen if the pupil takes a wrong turn following the sat-nav? Will they must have to continue to follow it, or will the examiner intervene? I think you can answer that. David? Um, <laughs> Come in, yeah. Right. Um, yeah, Nick can't answer any questions about what's going to happen on the new test. What everyone needs to is Nick is no longer with the DVSA. He hasn't conducted a test for over six months. Six months. Six yeah. months. So um, any questions like really most, be related? Uh, to, let me know what the answer is. <laughs> yeah. It's like most driving. It's like most driving examiners. Examiners. I'm told with some of the waiting lists. Anyway, moving on. Yeah. Uh, Julie, thanks very much for the question. Apologies for that. 
maybe what we can do is the questions that we can't specifically answer, maybe um, we can continue the conversation later on in vision without Nick. So we yeah. can continue. Yeah, but can I just answer part of that? Yeah. Um, like uh, like uh, until I left, if you've asked them to take the second road on the right and they've missed it, or they've taken the first one, as long as they've done it properly, they've checked in there, they've indicated they've positioned correctly, and they the car is going where the car is saying it's going, then there's nothing wrong with that. It's only they only panic. Sometimes they used to panic and say, "Oh, that's the road you wanted me to go," and they slam on the brake. Yes. Car behind had to break to avoid them, and it becomes a serious fault straight away. You know, if they of course someone to nearly slam into the back of you. Um, otherwise, if they just keep their cool, say, "Oh God, I missed it. I'll take the next one," or whatever. Or they could just ask the examiner and say, "Is it right if I take the next one?" And they say, "Yeah, well, you know, take it. unless it's uh, no true road." Or, yeah, no. <laughs> Hopefully you can see when the sat nav does so, come in that yeah, I mean, you can't it. make an opinion on, on this, Martin can, but I would imagine when the sat nav comes yeah. that it's going to run along with the lines. It's oh, we all done that though, following the sat nav, it, it's not always clear. And then you think, oh, sugar, I should have turned them. Yeah. And uh, it, it reroutes you. And that's it. <laughs> but just to really put the tin lid on that question, if, and correct me if I'm wrong, Nick, mm -hmm. If somebody goes completely the wrong way during their independent driving, as long as they do so safely and without committing a driver fault, i.e. signalling one way to turn and the other, yeah, that's okay. It should be all right. Yeah. yeah. And am I right in assuming that the DVSA, which I know you can't comment on, but uh, they train the examiners to say, uh, don't worry, you should have taken that last turn, but I'll give you some instructions to get you back on the Similar words to that, yeah. yeah. I mean, if they've done it two or three times, you think, well, this person's not going to do this, so you just say that at the end of the independent drive. I've done my bit, yeah. I've, I've done, I've attempted it, we've gone on it, and that's it. As long as you've attempted it, and then uh, you'll just do normal directions from there. Okay. okay, next question. Graham Smith. Every time I keep saying Graham Smith, I keep thinking of the opening back for South Africa. Um, that was Robin Smith. Now Robin Smith played for England, the um, second wicket down. Yeah, uh, but he was, he was South African. He was South African. <laughs> <laughs> Graham Smith does play for South Africa. Um, so Graham, uh, again, thank you, Graham. What determines multiple driving faults before it becomes a serious following distance? How close? Following distance. That, they're his words. Um, no. Please write your sentences properly, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. I'm a dick. <laughs> I need to get this out properly. What is he saying that when does... Um, well, he, he says, what determines multiple driving faults before it comes a serious, before it becomes a serious, and then he writes, following distance, dot, 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 how close? All right, so following distance. So it could be two things. It could be too close to uh, leading vehicles, as in plural, so he keeps doing it. So there's a drive fault, there's another drive fault, there's another drive fault. Um, how close? That's, uh, if he's starting to break the two second rule ish, uh, and you, you feel it anyway. Um, for example, uh, it, it doesn't normally happen on normal roads like 30 mile an hour roads, but where, where I used to work, we used to have a uh, 70 mile an hour road. Yep. Um, we used to go on there. And that is definitely, you know, if they're sort of like right behind them, but they've got two car lengths. And it, it, it's different if they're going to, they come up to the car and they check their mirrors and then they overtake it. That, that's no, that's not a problem there. But if they come up, and it's nine times out of ten, it's a large vehicle as well, because they're the ones going, chugging along slowly. So now you've got nothing to look at. You can't see what's past that lorry. And they remain like that, remain like that. And you think, half a mile, three quarters of a mile, that's when I come in and say, look, either hang back or overtake it, and it becomes serious fault. Yeah. Okay, uh, so are you, so you're, a, you as a, an examiner, you're, you're using your own mouse there. There isn't some sort of magic threshold. You're using your experience to go, okay, there's too many driving faults here. We need to mark this down as a, a, as a serious. It's your now more than... It's a trait in their driving. They're getting too close. And you get the ones that are lucky where they've gone right up behind the, 
a lorry, you think, oh, we're going to get serious support, and then the lorry turns off the next junction. And then they do it again to the next lorry, or whatever, you know. So mm. there's so many variables. Um, and, you know, with our experience, we know what is going you know, if you start, if your stomach starts to twitch, and you think, I don't like this, what if he stops, what if there's an accident right in front of him, yeah. we can't see. Like I said, nine times out of ten, it's always large vehicles that are going slow, where the learners can catch up to it. Otherwise, normal cars are always overtaking us. Yeah, we never, hardly ever overtake normal cars. Not All right, you've got another question coming in. I think I can answer it. Graham again. So this is going to kind of like in chronological order. Yeah. Graham again, he says, no signal given and no one affected. Is that a driver fault? Well, from what you've said earlier on, it is a driver fault, isn't it? Um, if it's once and you're looking around, if it's, in the, if it's a quiet road, side road, you could even get away with nothing there. Okay. But if they do it again, then it's a driver's fault because this is starting to become a, a, like a habitual. One. Habitual, not with two, no. but the second one, you think, no, I gave you that one. You, you, can't, have it. you, know, you can't have anything all the time. Mm -hmm. and, and, and this is what, it's a picture. It's a, it's a picture and it's merging. Um, so, yeah, the, the second time you will do. Even okay. Well, Ian, jump in and just say there yeah. is <clears throat> what you need to take away from this is the fact that examiners aren't robots and they do have to apply some discretion and it is going to be to the individual's examiner's discretion. Going back to the question about how close and you were talking about lorries. I've sat in enough tests to know that when the examiner's getting close to it, changing from a driver fault to a serious fault, mm -hmm. is when, so I've noticed the examiner, they, they will start to be prepared to use the dual yeah. controls if necessary. Would I be right saying that, Nick? Yeah, your right foot starts getting a little bit yeah. ready <laughs> uh, in case anything happens, so you need to be ready for that. It's bit twitchy. Uh, yeah, and then you're looking at, uh, and you do give them a, a hint sometimes. Yeah, you're looking at the, the actual lorry, and then you're looking at them. And then you look at the lorry, it's like when they go over the speed limit by a little bit. You're sort of going, you're looking over, and you're, going, <clears throat> you're trying to help them, because you know what? It, it's so much easier when they pass. You, when, you, when they pass, they're happy, you're happy. You, um, you go in, you just write down what they look like, Serial number of the pass certificate, and that is it. When it's a fail, you have to go in there, write down what they look like, and write down what sort they did, who it affected, how, it, how when, where was it done, really? yeah. where was it? Yeah, yeah. You, have, you write like a, it's, it's like a novel in the back sometimes. When no, really, I, I thought you were like the REF knocking down the Luftwaffe when you came back inside and you put the number of kills on your personal locker or yeah. something. I thought that's what examiners did. No, 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 no. It's so much easier when they pass. Uh, uh, and then there's less chance of them arguing. And obviously the ultimate thing is, oh, well, I'm going to complain then. Well, I can't stop you from complaining. I, I'm not going to change my mind, mate, because it's made up. It's no. done. You did that and you failed yourself. I did not fail you. I'm sitting here and I'm watching you either drive really good or muck it up. So... Yeah, it's so much easier when they do pass. So, you know, we are on their side, but unfortunately, when they can't, we've got a job to do. Otherwise, there'll be carnage on the road if we, oh, you know, I don't want to upset this one. You have to upset them. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's an industry where it's not a service like, um, like a, a, a food place. You know, you go into, a, oh, I'd like a coffee, and it's a lovely coffee, you drink it, everyone gets a coffee. Here, they all come in to get a license, but they don't all come back out with a license. As yeah. they realise we've been fair and we've given them a fair crack at the whip, what they should be thankful for, really, you know, they, and just take from it because we do normally, yeah, you know, not we don't tell them how to fix it because that's your job, yeah, that's that. job, but we explain it in such a way that they, they hopefully ain't going to do that again on the, on the next mm -hmm. one. But uh, yeah, we are, we should be on the same side. It's not, it did feel like that a lot of the time, but we should. Okay, James, what I'm going to ask you to do if you can, because I need you to help me. Mm -hmm. I've got 10 new messages that I've not read, 15 questions. I've got about 27 I've not read. So go for it, David. We can take right. it from here for a little while. Okay, so make them succinct as, as, as much as we can. Now, the next one, I think we've already answered it. How many minor faults for the same thing 
until it becomes a serious fault. Okay, so, <clears throat> depends what it is. Should we say steering fault? What, 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 what would you say, everybody, is more serious? Doing a steering fault or just missing out a mirror? It's got to be oh, oh, steering. Yeah, it, it's, <laughs> it's steering. Be steering it's steering. It? It's so, imagine that thing that I said before. So, this, uh, this person is oversteering on every left turn. He's not staying on, on the left side of the road. He's just going over that road. And each time it's a driving fault. So how many of those are we going, how many turns have we got on a driving test nowadays? You know, we've got loads. Yeah. So, you know, what, three, four? After the fourth one, that's it. Three or four, max. It depends the severity of them as well. It could be just a couple of inches over with nobody coming. It could yeah. be yeah. a two foot, but not enough in itself to be a serious. But, if I can jump in mm -hmm. there, if they do that, a lot of people, I know a lot of instructors think, that if it doesn't affect anybody, if there's no one there, it cannot be a serious no, fault. Will. But it will be, it won't will it? Be, yeah. Because one, you can't pass somebody who's got that habitual fault because one day there will be somebody will be there. Someone there yeah, you, know, you, you, you can't rely on luck, can no. you? No. It's the, um, I don't know if you know, but Ford have come out with this new thing called the crystal ball. <laughs> and it predicts, anyway, sorry, bad joke. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Graham Smith again, opening back for South Africa. Um, and I, I can see that I've got loads of questions. Chris, uh, Chris yeah. Benston, my friend Chris, has asked a few questions. Chris, I'll get on to you soon. Um, what is a foot brake fault? A uh, foot brake fault is when they don't brake. <laughs> so they come up to the uh, to, to pull up. Um, in, a, in a site and they're just continually not braking and they're going to hit the car in front or, or whatever it is and you've had to brake for them or it could be um, harsh use of brakes as well so in other words uh, they're coming up to turn left or right or whatever and instead of smoothly applying it they whack on the brakes hard and sometimes they do that so hard that it does affect the guy behind that's when it starts becoming serious Okay, thank you. Um, one from Mark Wardle. Mark Wardle, by the way. Good evening, Mark. Um, uh, Mark's coming to the Business Summit in January. And so if you guys haven't bought your, your, you ladies and gentlemen haven't bought your tickets, I hate using the word guys, um, then do so because Mark has bought four. Thank you, Mark. Um, and Mark says this, there's mixed opinions on calming interaction between instructor and pupil. What's the ruling? I deal with a lot of anxiety sufferers and sometimes I'll say, keep calm. The examiners are normally fine, but am I wrong to do this? I think he's referring when the test is running and he's sitting in the back of the car. Yeah. yeah. I'll want for him to say it. Yeah. No, he shouldn't no. say that. The, any instructor sitting in the back, he sits as an observer. He does not take part in any part of the test. He doesn't, he doesn't uh, say that he's in the test. I'm just reading yeah. between the lines now, out. If it is that, um, I mean, we, we, I used to sort of, you know, calm them down and, and before they've actually done anything, I'll say drive on when you're ready and just drive like you normally do. Yep. That, those couple of uh, little uh, words at the end, just drive like you normally do. Okay, and, thank you. And when they start making a fool, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll just say to them, just relax, just think about what you need to do. And hopefully those that fewer, there comes a point where you, you can't, you, you just have to stop saying that because they, it becomes patronising. Absolutely. <laughs> and they think you're uh, it's taking the mickey. You right. know, so, I don't know. David, um, to give you a chance to write some of these questions down, I've just got a couple of questions related to the DL25 that I'm going to ask Nick now. A bloody hell hurry up, mate, because I have got 25 questions in a question box. All right, okay. Questions on Facebook. Okay. All right, well, I'm just going to ask a couple quickly, okay. right? because I know when I've been doing what tests, um, these are sometimes the, um, the ones that you can get wrong. So can you clarify for people, what would be a clearance to obstruction for? Uh -huh. And how would you mark that at, instead of it being a steering fault? How, how can an instructor tell if it's a clearance fault or a steering fault? Right, so we've got a couple of cars coming up and the guy is just a metre away from the curve. So otherwise that would have been ideal, wouldn't it? Driving along, metre away from yeah. the curve, safety line. And um, 
they're not showing any signs of, of, of moving out. And so they come right close to it, right close to it. And then they steer at the last moment. That is a steering fault. Okay. Depending on how close it was, it could be a driving fault, steering fault, or if, if you've had to just give them a little nudge away, uh, it's a dangerous fault. Yeah. Okay. Uh, an obstruction of clearance, clearance fault is um, when one where they come out, and then you think, yeah, they're all right. Oh, oh they're not. They're a bit close. They're really close. They're going to take it close. And they've come around and they, they've just shaved it. They've gone really close. So it's not really their steering. It's their judgment of getting, it's their perceivement of being, you know, they think they're away it's, from. It's an error in judgment yeah. as opposed to an error in steering. Steering, yeah. yeah. I hope that answered that because a few people would send me a PM with that. That's fine. Am I allowed to get back onto mine? Yeah, yeah come on then. 27 questions and more on Facebook. Um, um, by the way, people are just joining us. We've got 137 that have logged in right now. Uh, you know, I mean, we've had 565 five, uh, in total registration. So, giving up your time. I know it's only crappy television like Emma Dell or whatever, you know, but, but to give up your time, quite honestly, uh, in the evening, you invest in yourself, you invest in your business, and quite importantly, you invest in driver training. So, I doff my hat to you. Um, Cameron Punjabi says, how many minor faults in one column cause a serious fault? So, three. Well, we've had that. Well, yeah, we answered that. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't fully answer it though, because um, yeah, you can have three or four before it becomes serious um, on steering, whereas opposed to something less important. I don't really like using those words, but uh, yeah, not checking your mirror before uh, signaling. They could have checked it earlier on and, you know, they could cover themselves in that. But, yeah, they're clearly not checking their mirror. So the driver goes down, which is more important. The steering, on the, it, it's got to be the steering is more important. So they can get away with more driver hooks in, the, in a, like a mirror. Right, because this relates to Cameron's next question. He says, why do some examiners give a serious fault for a total of four minors and some don't? It's... It's down to the actual topic, what you're saying, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Some I things are more important than others. You can't uh, allow them to go through, um, you yeah, know, like uh, pulling out of a junction without, uh, you know, getting it wrong slightly, you know, the uh, judgment. Uh, how many times are you going to let them do that, you know, uh, before you think, no, no, it's just too close for comfort and it becomes serious. Whereas if they just go over the lines a little bit or, or you know, there are... Uh, some folks are more weighty than others. Lovely. Well, I've got a question from Australia. I think most of the ADIs are going to know it, but the Aussies don't. They've got a different marking system down there. So good morning, Australia. I've got quite a few Aussies watching, actually. Um, Derek, uh, he says, is a serious fault in the UK an immediate fail, or is it just a point in an English test? Well, you can't. <laughs> it's a fail. It's a fail. It's a fail. Yeah. Thanks, for your, thanks for your question, Derek. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's all right. Um, Dave Barker, I, th I think it's David Barker. If it is, it's my mate from up in Liverpool. Um, well, because it was named down, he said Davis, but it, I, I often call myself Davis because he hit the C, the S, and the D around. Anyway, Davis writes If a pupil fails a test in the early stages, does the examiner continue to mark the test as faults occur or don't bother to mark at all? You, you, uh... By right, you've got to continue. While the test is still going, you've got to treat it as a test and, and continue to mark it. There, there are some, though, where they're coming thick and fast, and you only basically worry about the serious ones because uh, uh, they're doing so many faults. You can't see every single thing they're doing. You know, they they could be on a roundabout and they, they pull out on someone. They they position in the left. They cut across. They cut someone on the right and you know, three or four things all happen at the same time and, and then it continues to roll level down the hill type of thing. So, yeah, technically you're supposed to carry on uh, marking. Um, but practically you can't all the time. Sometimes you can't yeah, see you everything. Can't. But you are supposed to treat it, I mean, it's still a test, yeah. unless, of course, you, you or the person uh, terminates it. My, my apologies for the next one, because I'm going to have to read it as it is. This is from Anonymous Attendee. Um, hi, when would you assess a candidate driving at 40 miles per hour in a 30 zone receiving a minor? You wouldn't. 
No. That would be a theory to thought. All right. Thank you. Um, ah, Jonathan Daniels Bewley. Now, for those who didn't join earlier on, Jonathan's a very, very newly qualified AVI. Is that new? His car hasn't arrived yet. Um, um, and uh, Jonathan asks, he says, maybe for later, but on the DL25, what are the spare boxes for, numbers 28 to 32? Um, they could be for, I mean, we haven't used them for a long time, but if we've got things to give, I, th I think once we used to give out little pamphlets yes. years ago. Many years and ago. And we had to tick it just to make sure that we gave them the pamphlet. Yeah. That's it. It's just like a survey um, box. Okay. Um, Chris Benstead, Chris, I know you wrote this question 25 minutes ago. We're just getting to it. Now, Chris says DBSA in this, so we're going to have to put it, you're going to have to wear your hat on this or shift it over to Martin. Yeah. Why do the DBSA insist on marking symptoms and not causes? For example, too fast, third gear around the corner is marked under steering and not gears. Third gear around the corner? Yeah. Um... Well, it depends on the corner. Yeah, it's, but it's, it's real question is why? Why do they insist on marking symptoms and not causes? No, it is cause, isn't it? Yeah, it's cause well, and effect. Examiners are trying. Tell, hold me up if I'm wrong. Hmm. It. Examiners are trying to mark using cause and effect. That's the way you guys think. Is yeah. that not, not yeah. right? Can you explain that, please? Because I'm new to this, and I know there's quite a few PDIs on here, and a new AD, a few AD, new ADIs as well. What do you mean, cause and effect? Nick, I'll leave that to you. Um, well, cool. uh, you can do it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. Um, and I'll come in and help you. Right. Uh, imagine you're coming up to Chris, was, hi Chris, by the way, um, was saying a junction. So you're coming up to a junction too fast. You're going around it in the wrong gear. Okay. What effect did it have? And what was the cause of that? Was it because they were approaching too fast because they didn't realise they should be slowing down? Or was it because they selected the wrong gear by mistake? Um, yeah, and I think I know where, uh, if you've got a junction and they've tried to go over it without looking, uh, so you've got a crossroads and they're just hammering down at 30 mile an hour, uh, so they speed yep. uh, on the approach there, uh, but they don't look. It's, which one do you go for? You're not going to mark everything. So, uh, so you've got priority. <clears throat> so yeah, you prioritise. And um, it all depends how they've done it as well. You know, you've heard of 50 shades of grey. Well, the uh, driving test is about a thousand shades of grey. <laughs> you know, you've got your black and you've got your white and then you've got your bits in between and you have to take... Um, you just have to work it out what, what which is more important. And sometimes I've marked uh, the speed was too fast, couldn't look, well, didn't look. Sometimes I'll mark the observation. So well, Chris, <coughs> right, Chris writes in reply. Chris, thanks for replying very quickly, by the way. Mm. Um, he said, that's effect, not causes. We, ADIs, fix causes, not effects. It's therefore hard to identify the thing to fix. Yeah, if I, if I can jump in on that. I understand what you're saying there, Chris. Um, but and I'm going to speak on behalf of Nick here. It's not their job to get involved with how to address the causes. That's our job. Um, they've just got to make a judgment call on the day. Um, Am I right? Yeah, yeah, we, we don't, we're yeah, not allowed to uh, instruct. No, or, exactly. Say you should have done this, you should have done that. You, we say things like, do you remember at that junction you turned left without checking to your right? And um, it caused the other car to have to brake to avoid you or me mm. to stop you. You don't, you don't say, oh, you should have looked to your right and you would have seen the car. Yeah. Uh, this is why it's so important for ABIs to listen to the debrief at the end of the test because then they can if they've listened to it they can take that away with their pupil and they will know what the cause was and they can work on that but the exam I like that yeah and you know what I'm sorry Nick after you we love having the ADI sitting in the back because 
it, it just saved your half your uh, uh, debrief at the end because uh, fifty percent of the people do not don't realise what they did. You know, like they pulled out a junction, the cars had to swerve, but not enough for you to sort of take action. So in their eyes, you didn't do anything. Yeah. The instructor's in the back, and you you've got eye contact with the instructor in your mirror, and you know you can see his face being that was a bit close. And um, yeah, so it, what I'm trying to say is, um, pupils don't always see. But they don't always when, when you're not there. They don't always tell you the truth, or, or they don't remember some. Or they don't remember, or yeah. they don't they didn't notice yeah. as well. And it's always yeah. great when you guys sit in the back and, yeah. and you see how every examiner does his test and you'll see the delim- they should all be roughly the same. Obviously, you know, each test is different, yeah. you know. But, and, um, and speaking from personal experience, after somebody's failed, you can be, and you've, listen, you've sat in on the test, you've listened to the debrief and you're driving them home and they turn around and say, that bloody examiner failed me for something I didn't do. And you go, well, yeah, actually you did do it. And they go, no, I didn't. So, yeah, I was just sat in the back of the car. I, I saw you do it. And they just, they don't, it just doesn't register with them sometimes. I remember, um, I mean, it was a long time ago when I passed my driving test, uh, 22 years ago. And um, some of you thinking, 22 years ago, David, you are a young pup. Um, but my driving uh, instructor said, where did you go? And... I couldn't remember. I, I I remember telling him I was I was on the road between the Snipe pub on junction on the A38 and um, the next pub down on the A38 because I, I refused to overtake a hearse because it had a really long procession. And uh, I, I remember picking a minor up for that. He said you should have ever um, you should have ever took them. Um, but that was the only bit. And he said, you know, your test is what, 40, 45 minutes long, and you know I'm out there. And where have you been? I'm like. I remember yeah, that. I remember. Yeah, I remember that. I was pra- I was what's right in front of me right now. I'm giving monkeys what happened two minutes ago. I, I'm giving the monkeys what's happening right now. So I can really understand um, uh, the question. And yeah, one of the most common pieces of feedback that everybody watching this will have had from their pupils. Excuse me, on test. They say. I'm sure I failed, he brought me back so soon. I go, really? No, you was out there for 38 minutes, 40 minutes. I go, no, I was only out for 15, 20 minutes. It, it goes so quick for them. They, you know, they can't perceive the time and sometimes they, they can't that's perceive what happens the time. When you do yourself. Sorry, don't. See, when you do yourself, that's what happens. Look, let's follow on with this. Um, Trisha has just said, um, cause, um, Trisha's a fellow new ADI. Um, I know you get into no Trisha fellow well, actually. Evening, Trish. Um, cause and effect, and it's a combination of action and reaction. And, and I think it's Chris Benstead again following up mm-hmm. down here. Um, struggling to scroll down. I think it's Chris. Chris, it's missed half the name off here, not your fault. It says, however, so often people say the examiner said X, Y, Z, but the thing to fix is different. It makes things harder to understand for the pupil. Um, Derek in Australia again says, "Wish we were allowed to sit in the back of the uh, test here in Australia. Not allowed." Mm. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, yeah, to address what Chris was just saying, it is, and I'm sure Chris will probably agree with this. It's so important to sit in on tests because you get to see things that the pupil just doesn't, and you can help them with the cause of what the problem was. Um. Okay, let me get to some more of these. Um, Rachel Evans, good evening, Rachel. Thanks for logging in tonight with us. Um, she says, I have to say, I often explain to my pupils that if I were the examiner, it would have been marked as something else. But I also tell them that some, er- um, some errors could easily be marked in more than one category. Nick? Um, this touches on what we were talking about earlier. How, how do you decide whether it's clearance, or whether it's a steering fault. Another one that, that is very frequently um, mismarked is the difference between positioning normal driving and lane discipline. And that's one of the big big ones that gets misunderstood and mismarked by most ADI. So, yeah, please, Nick. So, with normal driving and, and lane discipline, 
uh, normal driving is when you're, uh, uh, well, lane discipline, I should say, is when you're uh, coming out of your own lane. So you've got a roundabout where there's two, uh, two lanes to go straight ahead. Yeah? Uh, so you're, you're, you've chosen the correct one to go ahead. You're in the left lane. But then when you enter the roundabout, you straddled into the, the off-site, the inner circle thing. Hard to explain. So, so basically so what they've done, they've straight lined the roundabout. Straight lined it, so that's lane discipline. They haven't stayed in their lane. Whereas normal driving, uh, you're going down the road, you've got a dual carriageway, and instead of staying in the left lane, they're in the right lane, bulking traffic. And that's the difference. That's the difference. Yeah. Right. Guys, I'm going to try and play devil's advocate with this a little bit. Um, so I'm going to be trying to answer some of the questions that you guys can't actually get because I've got Nick here with me. So um, bear with us on that. Can I go to the next question? Please do. Okay, so um, I've got 33 questions lined up and a load on Facebook. Um, I just want to tell people, if you're watching on Facebook and you haven't registered, I am giving... Um, priority there we go let's use a bit of a, a bit of a bit of a highway code term now. i'm giving priority to the people that have registered and if we get time to answer the facebook questions at the end then we will and um nick's in facebook vision group he's not an adi he's not a pdi he used to be an adi but neither am i i'm not an adi or a pdi either so i've let nick in um but ian actually he, he makes a statement here he says and Martin, this one's for you, really. Nick, okay. not for you, mate. Okay. I just, in, he says that I can. I understand you can fail on the show me, tell me questions from the 4th of December onwards. Yes, you can. And that would normally be on the show me ones on the move. Um, so that is going to happen on the 4th of December onwards. Uh, but it's only going to be if the candidate on test ends up doing something that could be construed as serious or dangerous because they can't show what they're meant to be showing. Okay, lovely. Um, I just want a quick shout out, by the way, to a few people that are helping us out right now. Carl yeah. Elsby, by the way, evening Carl up in York. Um, Carl, uh, somebody's asked me, asked a question, Ari Ahmed, and Ari's asking how many minors are the examiners allowed to give in total? And Carl's answered it. So, and I've seen a few of these um, um, uh, questions being answered by people on the webinar tonight. So thanks very much for that. Uh, it just shows how the industry try and do gel together and help yeah. each other out. Anonymous attendee, um, it'd be a good name for a pub quiz. Um, he, he or she writes, this is, goes back to earlier on. I don't quite understand this, so help me out here, Jax. The answer to show me, tell me is ask two questions at the start of every lesson. Right. What, what the uh, anonymous attendee is saying is to try and avoid your candidate making the fault on the test. You should incorporate it as part of the lesson on every lesson. Ask them a couple of questions on it. And yes, we're absolutely right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, you should incorporate everything that's going to happen on a test during the course of tuition. By the way, I think I know who anonymous attendee is. I reckon Chris Benstead's got like six six accounts here trying to get his questions through. <laughs> <laughs> Chris wouldn't do that. Um, um, Paula Carter, good evening, Paula. It's lovely to see you again. Um, is consideration given to someone who is who's very obviously nervous? To a point, yeah. You you when they're nervous, um, they they usually you can see. They can't even breathe, and I, I, I might even crack a little joke and say, "You know, you can breathe if you want to, you know, in, in that sort of thing." And it normally helps them out. Yeah, I'll crack a little joke, uh, and then you, you then tell them, to "Just calm down." And then when the mistake does come, look, just try and relax. Think about what you need to do. These are the sort of words that I used to say. But there comes a point where if they're not going to calm down and they keep making mistakes and they're in the middle of a traffic light system where they're turning right and they can't move off because they can't think of what to do because they're nervous, yeah. then they're going to fail, aren't they? So they have to overcome those nerves. So a mindset is, right, you're allowed to make a few mistakes, so you know, just relax. Show what you can do, not what you can't do. 
And that will go back to um, the previous question from Chris Benstead um, about the cause. What is the cause? Why are people nervous? Why are they so nervous on the test? Because quite frequently, they don't feel confident of doing it. And then you go track it back another step. Why don't they feel confident of doing it? Because they haven't been properly prepared. They haven't practiced enough. A lot of instructors, and I'm going to get slated for saying this, take people up for test when they're not ready. Because we do, as instructors, we get put under financial pressure, where sometimes by parents saying, oh, I've spent 800 pounds, 1,000 pounds on my, my kids' lessons and you still don't think they're ready for test. And you feel like, well, should I take them just to keep the parents happy? You know, we, we get it from all angles. And then we get a phone call from you guys saying, I'm bringing someone up because his mum and dad says that yeah. he's ready for the test and he's threatening to come in their own yeah. car. And hey, I, Mark, I hey, you know what? They, they could have had 80 lessons and spent two and a half grand yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, on it. If they're not ready, they're not ready. They're not ready. Yeah, uh, some people are ready after five lessons. Yeah, you know? I, I get slated. That's the main long. point of, of the webinar for tonight, so that you can get all of the information and knowledge from Nick, just drag it out of him and apply it to using it on your mock tests, so you can more accurately mark a mock test. Because if you can more accurately mark a mock test, you're more able to gauge whether that particular person is really test standard or not. Well, I'll tell you, when I first came into this industry, I spoke to a lot of driving instructors about best practice. And a lot of them said, always make sure your pupil does a mock test and never do it with you because you can't replicate who the examiner is, even if you've got the best looking high vis yeah. in your boots. It's Get always it. a good um, idea to pair up with another driving school, your you know, mates or whatever, and just take each other's um, pupils. pupils yeah, and absolutely. Them that way. Um, I need to swear. Hmm? Go on, uh, I'm going to tell Mark Wardle to bollocks um, because he says, can we have more attractive panellists next time, please? Ah. In fact, I'll tell you what. I, what yeah. I'm going I'm to give you a question. I'll let you answer it. I'm going to disappear for two seconds. So... Um, Alex writes, if a pupil changes lane on a roundabout, when would this be acceptable? So you answer that, and I'm back in a tick. Okay, Nick, changing lanes on a roundabout, when would it be acceptable? Well, when it's supposed to be done. Okay, <laughs> so would it be acceptable no. if they were to change lanes without checking their mirrors? No, they've got, as long as they've checked their mirrors, it that. Are we talking right? I'm not sure about the, the question there, but if we're turning right, we're going to be starting in the right hand lane, and yep. then of course, when we're coming off, we need to go into the near side lane. That's yep. the ideal way to do it. Okay, so and when they change lanes, just before they change lanes, we'd like, uh, we'd like mirrors, yeah, so I can be aware if there's anyone coming up on their near side. Yep. The only way to do that is to check their near side mirror once. If they're checking their near side mirror, then you've got peripherals for anything coming from your left as well. Yeah. Uh, and it has a, a double effect, it's that double whammy. So you check in and you're looking from your peripheral, put your indicator on and go on. Okay. Now, I know how instructors think because I'm one of them. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to play devil's advocate and throw yeah. this back at you. Right? There's going to be people out there thinking now, okay, you're mentioning about signaling coming off. What about if it's a mini roundabout? We mini roundabout is uh, no, you don't. You don't really need them. You don't. Well, don't need to indicate to come off. Should I say? Right. Yeah. Okay. And the reason for that would be there's not enough time. There's not enough time because yeah. it would compromise the control of the steering. Yeah. I mean, when you're turning right at a mini roundabout, do you indicate left coming off? No. 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 So basically, we're the, the main uh, thing to do is to teach them how you would drive. Oh, you are back? Hi. I am back. And when I went out, I wanted to get something to make myself look more attractive for Mark Wardle. But when I came back, I realised I'd lost connection. So I don't know if Mark Wardle feels this is more attractive. Um, oh, yeah. I can, yeah, but, you know, me and Nick need that more than you do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, OK, let me try and find some of these questions. Um, I've lost 
internet connection here for about 10, 20 seconds. And what happened is I've lost all my Q and A questions, Martin. So can you, if you move your mouse around on your screen, you'll see what says Q and A at the bottom. Can you see that? Yeah. Can you, and it should, it's got a number in there, like 35 or something. 30, like that. 33. Yeah, can you click on that, please? Because you still will have the Q and A questions, but it it, wow. it wiped them out for me. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. It's blocking a lot of the screen, so I hope you guys can still see. We can still see both of you, no problem at all. Right. Okay. Um, Martin Seal was asked handbrake. Show me, tell me. Question: How would you answer the question if your car has an electric handbrake? Yeah, through the motion. Go there you go, go through the motions. Quick answer. It doesn't have to be, the engine doesn't have to be on, on that. Um, I know some cars it would have to be. But if the examiner says, well, yeah, do it, then start the engine up and do it. Okay, cheers. Right, next one. Ari Army. Would an examiner fail someone if they do 50 miles an hour in a 70 mile an hour road? Nick? Hmm. It depends. It's, it's one of those. <laughs> I think still so. Um, it's um, uh, nine times out of ten. Well, in my experience, in the roads that I've been on yeah. in North London, the answer would be no. You can't fail for that. Um, 50 is a reasonable amount. I mean, we would prefer 55, 60, just so they, it just shows. That they know that it's not a 50 mile an hour road. Yeah. Some of them come up, they accelerate like hell, and they get to 50, and it's like they they break there. And yeah. you think you and you know exactly that they think that it's a 50 mile an hour road. But 50, it's okay. It, there are maybe there's other roads where it's a really open, fast yeah. 70 mile an hour road. And if it's, uh, I don't know what the new test is going to be like because they're going to be bringing more faster roads, I don't yeah. know, but maybe it's going to have more meaning on those and maybe it could turn out to be serious, I don't know, but okay. in my experience so far, 50 is, is okay, as long as it's a solid 50 and not sort of 48, 45. Okay, got a really good question now from Mike Rogers. Is it okay for a pupil to get out of the car while doing a reverse bay park to check they're going into the lines okay? Actually, why not? <laughs> uh, as long as they've done everything, put put the handbrake and everything, and really they should right. switch the engine off. But I don't know if this is a DSA, a DVSA thing still. I don't know. Well, I can let me answer. Yeah, go on. Right. And I know this is a fact. Um, if they want to get out of it, if they just want to open the the door and have a look, as long as they've secured the car, that's fine. The examiner doesn't mind that whatsoever. If they want to actually get out of the car, walk around and see if they're within the lines on the near side, uh, they do have to switch the engine off. If they don't switch the engine off, that will go down as a serious fault. Okay, so I hope that clears that one up. Um, right, let me just move down this chat box a little bit. There we go. I'm not used to doing this. All right. Um, I've got one for you. Go on. Right, okay. I've got loads. They're on Facebook. I got some I got a dodgy lady called Maria Leather, you might know her, but I'll come on to her in a minute. She's very dodgy. <laughs> Ellis Wood. Uh, evening Ellis. And Ellis and I have been it, Ellis was on last night actually. Ellis, thanks for your contributions, I really appreciate it. Um, Hi, Ellis writes, does the examiner take into account the rest of the drive before setting a severity on a particular fault? No. Uh, technically, if it's a serious fault, it's a serious fault. And they're the ones that hurt the most from an examiner's point yeah. of view. If they've been driving really well and they've just done a, a, a serious fault, I won't say silly serious fault, because they're all serious, serious faults, uh, then they will fail for that. Yeah. Um, At least I can, I can give you an a, a absolute nth degree answer. Zero driver faults, one serious, done in the last 30 seconds of the test. They've given a perfect drive for 38 minutes, then they did something that was 
very serious. Still got to go. You can't take into account the rest of the test. Yeah. They've got to be failed. Yeah. Failed. The flip side of that, they can fail moving off as well. Yeah. But the biggest theory is called moving off. And then drive the, perfectly yeah, for the rest of the, the rest. And why do they drive perfectly? Because they turn around to you and say, yeah, I knew I was out after that. So and then they relax. I didn't care. And the I didn't care turned into a more relaxed drive. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thanks for that. Paul Harcourt. Evening, Paul. How are you doing, mate? Um, Paul says, if a student lets the car roll back on a hill twice or responds quickly, is it marked as a driving fault? Paul, I'd say to you, get an automatic. I'd agree. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, it's... Um, no, the, the, what, what, sorry, what was it? What if, 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 if they drive... If they yeah, roll if they back, it twice, yeah. yeah. Will that be a driver fault? Yeah. It depends how far they, they roll back. If it's just a couple of inches, you know, we're talking little okay. bit, that's nothing. But if they roll back a foot, yeah. two foot, that's, yeah. that's a, a driver fault every, every day of the week. And they've done it twice. If they've done it on the same occasion, they, it, so they've done one foot and then another foot, yeah. that, that only goes with one foot. That's yeah, no you can't mark. Yeah, yeah. Right. Okay, Dave, are you back in control of the chat box? I can't see the 30 other questions we missed out on. Um, I've got two coming in at the end, so go on. I'll let you do the next three or four. Make, right. make, make them like bullet point ones, though, because right, okay, we could an hour and ten, and we could, right. even, we could take this another three hours. Okay. Right. Cyclist in front, solid white lines, travelling at 15 miles an hour. Nothing coming clearly. It's safe. Would you expect them to overtake or hang back? Five points for a cyclist, mate. Ten points if you hit them on the side door. I couldn't possibly comment. <laughs> uh, yeah, because technically we, we all know that they should be doing ten miles an hour cyclist, shouldn't they? So we can overtake a, a solid, double solid line uh, if they're doing ten miles an hour. But then, you know, where we're sitting, they might have been doing ten. Yeah, yeah, it's hard to tell from that angle. So, Go on then. Next one. Next yeah. one. During an examiner's debrief at the end, how much technical input is an examiner allowed to give? Now, we've touched on this already, yeah. right? Uh, is it okay for an examiner to almost give a full guided explanation? Not can, really. can, we, can we, hold on a sec, can we include a PWB on that as well? And that part of that question. Yeah, okay. Yeah, we, yeah. Were, we were discussing they, it earlier. They shouldn't be giving too too much because, uh, but sometimes you do get, um, you fall into that, either with the candidate saying, yeah, but I did this and that, and then you have to add a little bit more. Yeah, but I, I, I knew that was happening oh. and I did that, and they're sort of got a gear with it. Right. Well, what yeah. David was alluding to there. And a P and a B. A P and a B. Yeah. Oh, a pass and a bollocking. Yeah. Yeah. Chris yeah. Ben's there. Thanks, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, there, there, there are times when, you, when, when you've got, when you've got a good drive, you said it earlier on, when a serious fault is a serious fault, you can't tell. But when it's, yeah. oh, remember the grades I said? Yeah. That's when it comes in, you think, you know what? Um, or, fuck it, they keep doing it. You know, like they've done three move-offs and they haven't checked their blind spot. And you're just about to, to put a serious ball, you know, three or four, should we say? The rest of the drive is spot on and they just haven't. And these are the um, continental drivers that do that because they don't normally check their blind, blind spot, spot, yeah? Because their blind spot is on their left, isn't yeah. it? Um, so, and then you, you think, oh, my God, yeah. right, you do that once more, it's going to be, and then they start looking. And you think, yeah, you know, they've done, uh, how many have they done with and how many without? And in the end, you say, oh, okay, look, I'm going to pass you, but please be aware that you've done it on how many occasions you've done it? Yes, I know, sir, and I was, uh, that's why I started doing it. So, you know, they're, at nine times out of ten, they're aware of it anyway. Right. Guys, that is tolerance. Yeah, it's not official DVSA policy yeah. to issue a pass and a bollocking. No. Okay, this is just Nick's personal <laughs> Bollocking, you don't bollock and bollock them. You just, well, you know, you tell them that, you know, the that nothing was coming. Yeah. Um, right, quickly, um, I'll deal with this one. 
Obviously, the DL25 is going to alter with the new test. However, what driver faults constitute an ancillary controls? It's a newbie question from Jonathan Daniels Ewling. Cheers, Jonathan. Yeah, I can answer this for you. Um, if it's raining and they forget to put the wipers on, that could go down as a serious fault in ancillary controls. And vice versa, um, if it's not raining and they accidentally put the wiper on because they thought it was the indicator and they didn't cancel it and you end up getting it squeaking and the wiper blades are smoking, that would also go down as a serious fault. Is this new then? Right, is it new test? No, that, that's in a, but that would be the same in the old test. Oh, I never used to put a serious fault for, um, especially the back one. Um, you know how they, sometimes they, they push it or pull it and the back one's going yeah. and it's squeaking along the thing. Like, and you, get, you pull them up and say to them, do you want to sort that out? And they are trying. Um, that's, you're just helping them out to, 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 to take it off. Well, that's um, right. So you just so you don't damage the instructor's yeah. uh, windscreen right. or yeah. you know, the, the thing at the back. Well, when, when we finish tonight, I'll have a little chat with you about one that happened. Uh, well. Yeah, and if it's raining, you'd, yeah. say to them, you'd actually help them out and say to them, do you want to put your wipers on? And it's just a little prompt. You wouldn't fail them uh, and then say, put your wipers on. You want to put your wipers on. And right. so, you know, my, from my own experience, it becomes serious, is when they're fiddling about with it, driving along and they're fiddling about because they, uh, they haven't been taught how to put it on or yeah. whatever. And they're doing that and the steering goes and you're having to grab the steering wheel to take action. That's a serious fault, obviously, because they've lost control of something else. In this case, the steering. Right. Um, but I won't put it down. And I, uh, I think I'm right in thinking that we don't, we shouldn't be putting it down. I'm not, I'm, but I was personally, I wasn't. Okay, that's yeah. Well, we're talking about a little bit of um, flux in the system here, you know, a little bit of um, um, acknowledgement to, uh, to their understanding and the pressure that they're under. Uh, Janet has uh, popped up a great question. Are examiners given special training to understand how to help those with special needs, such as autism and dyspraxia? Uh, not special um, training, just training. It's part of your training in Cardington. You, you touch on the, all these things. We, uh, when I did my course 27 years ago in Cardington, we, did the, um, we went over to a place called Mavis where they had all these cars, it was off-road, and they had all these different cars uh, with different adaptions. And they, they, we actually got to drive all these cars, they had one with a joystick, one with a little stick, you yeah, know, we were just playing with them all day long. So um, how, how, how much training does a, an examiner get on disability or special needs tests? Well, that day was the day that we, we had, we just concentrated on, on those cars. I'm not sure what they do nowadays because uh, uh, they've changed the system so many times since I've been uh, an examiner. Uh, can't keep up with, I couldn't keep up with them. But uh, for me personally, I spent a day um, doing that. Uh -huh. And it was part of your training where, you know, that you're talking about a subject. But, yep. you know, remember if they can't understand you because of uh, maybe they've got disability or some sort, yep. then uh, blah, 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 blah. And then you, you just touch on it a little bit, part of the main training. So right. we didn't sort of go in a class and say, today we're going to talk about um, dyspraxia or dyspraxia mm -hmm. or autism, or anything like that. See, you see, for me, I don't want this to go, I don't want this to go away from personal uh, because it is personal. It's about you and your opinion tonight. Mm. But from what you're saying, I think a lot of driving instructors are going to be... Right, David, you've frozen there. <laughs> um, I don't know if you're doing that deliberately, but I'm going to carry on. There's a few questions that we can answer really quickly. Um, Ari Armin says, is the examiner allowed exactly. to change his decision? Example, if you told someone that they haven't passed their test, but two seconds later you wanted to change your decision, is no, that you, you can't, can't do it? No, no, okay, sure. that's great. Another one, quickly. I heard a rumour that examiners are allowing a second go at the emergency stop. Is that correct? No. Um, 
Right. If, if an example of me allowing them a second go. Uh, you've told them very shortly, I'd like you to stop as an emergency, blah, blah. This yeah. has been a signal. They've gone up, they've driven down, yeah. and then you've given the signal, and they've checked the mirror, indicated and pulled to the side of the road. Right. Uh, if this person, especially if their English is not their first language, they might have misunderstood you. Okay, and that's the only time I'd ever say, I think you've misunderstood me. Uh, let me just go over that again. So and, that would come and, down to your then, own discretion. Yeah, and then I'd say, stop. And then I'll add my own little bit. Imagine a child has just run out in front of you and you've had to break to avoid it. That's uh, what I'd like you to do. So when I give you the signal, imagine that's happened and then I'd like you to stop as quickly and as safely under control. Okay, brilliant. Moving on, we've got a specific one. Um, Right, Jonathan Daniels Bewley again. Sorry, he says another one. Don't worry, that's what we're here for. What is considered for box seven vehicle checks? Oh, that's the, um, that's, I've been doing it for a while now. That, that is the, yeah, that's the show me question. Yeah, there you go. Got me that's thinking there. All right. Paula Carter's written on here, it's disappointing that examiners are not given specific training in dealing with pupils with SEN. Um, now, I know this is a, a personal thing tonight, uh, personal to Nick, and uh, it's not cross board of DVSA, but maybe there's some things that we can pull out tonight in a nice and understanding way where through your associations, you could speak to the DVSA and say, look, you know what, there is a need here. Um, for well, me, um, you know, you, you might have a pupil that could be a, a really, really top driver, let's say it's on the autistic spectrum, but then because of the questions are phrased in a certain way within the car, the, autist, the, 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 the person with the special education needs can't quite comprehend it. And then because of the, that pressure creates, creates the faults, if that makes sense. Yeah, uh, I didn't really say we don't. I, I did say we treat and we have, we touch upon it during a normal training, in my own experience. Mm -hmm. If you get someone who's hard of hearing or who's, uh, you know, a vacant expression or things like that, so we have, we do touch upon it. But that should be a good bloke. Go out of their way to, uh, we didn't, should I say, in my days, go out of our way to do uh, a a day or two because you know I mean time is tight as well you know yeah. uh, we just did one day for physical um, disabilities, disabilities but mm -hmm. not uh, anything extra but that we just included it on we tagged it along at the end of each thing if, if it yeah. warranted it right there's a question from Simon Nicolau ah, relative maybe maybe <laughs> right if a candidate applies a signal in good time and then checks the mirrors immediately, and then starts losing speed, will that be a fault? So apply the signal first without yeah. checking, and then check the mirrors immediately, yeah. and then start losing speed, will that be a fault? Yeah, that's one of those where... Could be, couldn't it? Yeah, could be, could be not. Could be, could be not. But if he carries on doing it, it would be. Yeah, absolutely. Even if he's related to yeah. you. Okay, David Howe has asked... Oh, Oh, it's more of a statement. Thank you to everyone for putting on this webinar. It's much appreciated. You're welcome. It's what we do. Um, unfortunately, I have to leave to pick up my son. Well, have fun. Look forward to seeing the rest of the webinar tomorrow. Okay, David, have a nice drive to pick up your son, and you're very welcome. Um, Nick. Trisha Hagen. Trisha, again, north of the border, Trisha. Yep. Um, my car, I cannot see a speedo. I think she's been drinking too much iron brew. Um, so I use a heads up unit. There's a two mile an hour difference between car speedo and the hood display. Um, car shows two mile less than the heads up unit. How would this work for a test? Um, personally, <laughs> I would, um, I'd check it. Uh, when, when you've got, um, I mean, the Yaris is like that, weren't they? Just the old one, one yeah, the old one, that's it. And if there was something like that, 
here to help me uh, heads up display thing, private thing. They they are. I I found them to be out as far as five miles an hour. Um, and the only reason I know that is because I'm I can tell. I used to be able to tell because how many time, how many hours have I spent in a car? I can tell when a a, a car is just one mile an hour fast or or slow. Uh, and you you get a, a, a you get to know that they are. And the way I do it is I I I go right the way over, I lean over, nothing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm right. Yeah. And yeah, I always double check and I compare that with that and I think, yeah, I knew that one was wrong and that one's right. Yeah, Rachel Evans says that hers is two miles an hour out too. Yeah. Judith Hicks, um, Judith, help me out of the bath. Uh, <laughs> she went in there yesterday. Um, how is it decided what test route the pupil is given and how is it decided what examiner is chosen for the pupil on test? Yeah. As instructors, do we have a nominated examiner that we get for a percentage of tests? Great question, Judith. Yeah, we wrote that down earlier, Judith, right. and we, we were planning on answering So that. let's do one at a time. The, the test route, you're supposed to uh, do them evenly. So yeah. you're not sort of favouring, say you've got 10 routes, you're not favouring route one all the time. Okay. And that's where you're getting all your passes, you're getting all your fails and what have you. So you do an even spread. So it's a matter of pot luck. So you go at one, two, three, four, or you can be going 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, or you can go one, three. You know, there's so many systems. I used to have a system where it was like a graph, and I just, um, maybe there's, uh, I didn't want to do that first thing in the morning because it's too busy, so I'll skip that one and do that, but I'll come back to it later. And so you just put a little cross, a uh, little cross or a little line going down. So by the end of the week or month or whatever, you've got an even spread of doing an even. Is that the same for manoeuvres as well? Yeah. Right. So so some, some, sometimes you go on one route and it, it you can never find the reverse around the corner um, or reverse a, 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 a bay path, you know, um, you know, reverse, what do you call it? Parallel path. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, you just, you just do... You do what you can when you can, basically. As long as you've got a little graph to tell you, and you do an even spread, and these things are noted, so you can't really um, end up doing too many at once. Right, I'm going to ask a question now that really gets to the very crux of why we're doing this webinar. Um, lots of examiners, lots of DVSA staff will attend meetings with you, and they have to give you a answer that is in line with DVSA policy and they can't give their own personal opinion and that's this is what this is all about tonight guys so Nick I'm going to throw this grenade at you now you've obviously examined on many tests no no you're not getting away with it mate you've obviously examined on many tests why do you think that the pass rate is so low your own personal opinion well, they're not ready there you go they're not ready simple as that what did you say? Not ready. Not, not ready. ready. Yeah, I had to give you an idea. Uh, I've taught my my close relatives because we were allowed to, and we still are, as far as I know. You're allowed to teach your own kids, your brother's kids, and as long as you uh, ask for permission, you've told them what car you're going to be using, um, and obviously, um, you know, when they're ready for tests, you, you tell tell your boss, your line manager. He comes down and does the test. So there's no one in the actual test center going to do it. Uh, but I taught uh, oh, my daughters, my nephews, nieces, uh, probably about 10, something like that, 10 people. And all the past first time? All past first time, the highest, the most marks they've had is three. And, and those my own daughters and I had a go for that as well because they shouldn't have got anything okay uh, yeah I, I'm but, gonna, let me put that on because case. because I gave them and I gave them gave them te uh, a lesson after lesson and to the point where I was getting bored there's right. nothing for me to say uh, a lot and that's when you know no, if ready. your mouth is not uh, yapping away you know that they're you know they, they are ready okay I had this question sent to me by several people Okay, and it, it kind of flips what you just said around because what you just said indicates that an examiner, although you were an ADI previous to being an examiner, can possibly prepare a candidate better. 
do you, in your opinion, think that instructors, ex-instructors, make the best examiners? Ex-instructors? Yeah. Ex you think ADIs, yeah, who become examiners, oh, right. yeah. do you think they make the best examiners? Uh, it helps. I would say it helps because they've got an idea, they've got, they've got an interest in the industry as well. Yeah. Um, I used to diplomatic. I used to do check tests. I used to love it. You know, mm -hmm. like pretend sort yeah. of mock tests. Um, and I used to sit in the back and test and see how it's done. But um, yeah, I used to like doing it. And it is a. I would imagine it's uh, anything, any knowledge that you have in the industry is going to be an advantage. Um, There's four different people. Yeah. Sent that question through. So thanks for answering that. I've got it. I've got it. My uh, uh, relatives and what have you, they were close relatives, and it was for no money as well, by the way, just in case. And I wasn't allowed to test them. No one in the test was allowed. Yeah. I had to get my area manager to come down and, and, and do it. Yes. Yeah. I've got a bit of a question for you, and it's not really fact, it's a bit of a few pieces that I've put together, and I'm asking your personal opinion. Uh -huh. I'll give you a bit of foundation to it. I know the government are statistic mad. Um, and, and, and have to be, and we look at the law of averages, and we look at law of, and within averages, we look at tolerances as well. And maybe they have recorded a million driving tests, and throughout those million driving tests, they record, let's say the pass rate is 48%. So if that is a true average over a million driving tests, let's say, mm -hmm. and then you have an examiner who for the last three months his pass rate is 20% or 80%, would the test, man, test centre manager get involved at that point? Because there's a lot of you, I mean, there's a point on here where Graeme Smith said, you know, sensitive question, do examiners have to pass or fail a certain amount to balance books? And I'm kind of adding to that in terms but of... Right, I'm someone said that, I'd be a millionaire then. Um, <laughs> No, there isn't. Um, there isn't a quota as such or anything. Um, firstly, you say the national average is forty-eight. It could be that. I don't know. I'm guessing forty-seven, forty-eight. Whatever. Um, but then that is, is that that is averaged over, say, somewhere as a, somewhere in Scotland, is about 80 percent pass rate. And then you've got other places in in inner London ish. Um, and they're, they're down to late 20s, yeah. so you've got a fair there. What it is, that test centre, whatever its average is, so let's just say, for example, it's 40%, that yeah. test centre we're talking about, and you've got uh, an examiner who's 20%, you've got an examiner who's 80%, then yes, um, there will be more um, a company test. Um, and if there's something wrong, you should bring it out. Um, so what you're not doing then is you're not working to, they don't work to a quota, but if it's out of kilter, yeah. they're yeah. kind of monitored to understand why. Yeah. And, and really, uh, a true, you know, if you're doing your job properly, you, you, your, your pass rate will be going up and down all over the place. It, it's just, you know, it's just the lack of the draw. Uh, and sometimes, I mean, to give you an idea, when they were doing, bringing the theory in, our pass rate, all of our pass rates just plummeted because everyone was coming in, uh, you know, because uh, they, they were ready. They were scared yeah. that they had to do a theory. Yeah. And uh, the same thing when the interpreters were going to be out there. We just had an influx of people and it was just, your pass rate goes down. So you've got all these things. Christmas comes along, I don't know it. Summer. You've got all these little things that it just goes up and down. The, the thing you should be wary of as a test centre manager, which I was for, uh, for a few years, is when your um, per, uh, people are all on the same length and they, it's like a deadline, you know, like okay. a flip, flip. Uh, if it's always, you think, that, sounds, that looks artificial, you know. Uh, yeah, robotic and not natural. Yeah. And it's, it's so nice to see all that because that's what happens. You've got different people, different areas, uh, different tests, 
and it's going to go up and down. Um, I'm going to read a, a few lines out here from Rachel Evans. Rachel, thanks again for your contributions tonight. So I'm going to ask for your opinion on this. Where do you feel what you're at? So Rachel suggested to Mike Penning, MP, that the DVSA should stipulate a compulsory minimum number of hours. As we as instructors are continuously fighting pupils and parents who think they know better than us, and when we suggest that an average of 40 to 60 hours of driving experience is needed, um, they do to agree. They do to agree. They don't agree. Oh, they don't agree. We need backup from the DVSA. Do you think, in your opinion, that ADIs need official backup so we can at least have a minimum amount? Well, personally, it wouldn't, it wouldn't harm. It could only do something for road safety, wouldn't it? The more lessons they have, I go back to my own daughters. From where but they did set it in islands about 10. Uh, you know, um, so yeah, I mean, anything that's going to bring them more prepared has got to be good for road safety. Isn't it? I mean, that's my own personal view. That, that's what they here for, mate. If it's less, it is about your personal view. I know that if they have less lessons, the chances are they'll be not as prepared and less safe on the road, surely. And um, Chris Benford said, David, hasn't the minimum hours in France damaged the market? Chris, what I can tell you about the minimum hours in France is this. Um, I can tell you this, not from personal experience, but a friend of mine called Mercedes. Um, she doesn't drive for them, unfortunately for her. Uh, but her name is Mercedes, there we go. And um, she started driving with her parents, because you can do that, you've got a logbook, and you've got to do so many hours. And then you've got to take so many hours to the driving school. Now, the thing is in France is you don't have examiners in France. The driving school is licensed to do it. And so you have to take 20 hours, but, they, but they, uh, the instructor will say, I think you need to take 22. Uh, and then if you don't take the 22, you know what's going to happen. You're going to, you know, you're going to fail. But Chris, I, I, I don't know too much about the minimum hours in France and damaging the market. I do know that, you know, you complain in Britain about uh, you can't get a test for two or three months. Well, in France, it's six months to get a driving test. Mm -hmm. um, uh, if you want me to find out more, Chris, then, you know, I can do on that. Okay, let's have a look at a few more questions. Um, Derek from Aussie uh, was saying earlier that if you don't indicate on a roundabout or uh, you roll back on a hill, <clears throat> instant fail. Really? <laughs> <laughs> You don't want to take him to Swindon then, do you? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Derek's also asked, what's the, what's the percentage rate, pass rate in the UK? Derek, it's all done from different areas, but it's around about 48%. But then you can look at male, male and female, then you can look at different age groups, then you look at first-time pass rates and second-time pass rates, and again, you've got different areas and things like that. And then you can even look at manual and automatic. But I think grouping it all together, it's about 47, 48%. Oh, and you've got ages as well. The younger they are, it tends to be the fewer lessons that they need. Tends to be. Um, Ari Ahmed has said, have you ever unliked a driving school? I think Ari means, have you ever disliked a driving school? Uh, <laughs> Apart from uh, QVG. <laughs> That's Martin's. Uh, yeah, thanks, thanks for that. Nice plug. Some, personally, we're not supposed to uh, like or unlike, but unfortunately, uh, like every market, there are people that bring, constantly bring people that are not ready for their test, and you think, oh, I'm not there again. But, and I say but, because you do, you know, you, once you're in the car, you give the same per the, the person the same chances that everybody else, not just because these instructors have to be not as, I don't know. So, so you have no yeah. preconceived yeah. ideas if about they can what drive, they can they drive, can drive. They, they'll get a pass. But unfortunately, there are some, uh, I don't know how they sleep in there all the time with their figures and stuff. I don't know if they do keep figures, you know, DBS, they do keep figures. I don't know, but I know it's the question there. Yeah. So I thought before you crossed it out. Uh, 
Um, but yeah, there are some that they do, and there's others that are, you think, oh great, I've got this, oh that's going to be a good drive, and that's a fact of life. Yeah, you, know, you get good doctors, you get good teachers, mm-hmm. you get you know bad in those as well. So what can I say? You get good and bad examiners. But it doesn't influence yeah. your decision on no, the market. No, no, no. Personally, I, I, I think, oh, no, not that one. They, oh, actually, which is good. And it's refreshing. Good. And I actually try to give them so many times and say, oh, that's a good drive. Thank you. Uh, to give them some sort yeah. of uh, thing. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. That's your way of saying yeah. yeah, we need more. more. And I did appreciate any, any exam, instructor that comes up. Uh, brings us a really good one. I always used to like to uh, just sort of say, oh, thank you for that. It was a nice drive. And, you know, just to give them, you know, a, a little pat on the back. Why not? They deserve it if they brought someone up. Yeah, I'm going to read a question out here. I think it might have been answered earlier, so it has tell me straight away. You know, when I was out finding my wig for Mark Wardle. And yep. um, Absol Chowdhury, you probably lost my question last again. I'm going to reverse around the corner while reversing. If the learner's gone a little wide, is he or she allowed to drive forward in order to correct it, or would that be marked down as a serious fault? A little wide? No, it shouldn't be. Okay, so they could actually then drive forward to come back on themselves. Well, if it's just a little wide, just finish it off, and that's yeah. it. So it was a little wide. And um, sometimes you do get that where it's a little wide. You think, oh, it's a little bit wide. Maybe a driver's fault. And then they, they say, oh, can I go forward? And I'll just say uh, um, something which is, always gets me out of trouble. Just do what you normally do. And I think you find most examiners say mm. that. Do what you, uh, what you think. So the onus is on them. And then they go forward and they muck it up. And they've done it. And, you think, and then they go, oh, I'm going to go all the way around. And they, it's gone all the way around. They come back and the whole thing's a mess. Okay. So, Quit while you're ahead, maybe. Yeah, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah, you know, if it's just broke a little bit, it might you might get away with it. It's not uh, a little bit. She's described it as a little bit. Yeah. You're right. Now, if you reverse back and you're on the wrong side of the road, and then they say, "Can I go around?" Um, I'm afraid that's not necessary. You just say to the driver when you're ready, because mm. they're completely on the wrong side of the road. Yeah. You know, it's not the best out of three. Uh, but if it's a little bit wide or a bit more than a little bit wide, because there's, like we said, a thousand shades in between. So they've gone round, I don't know if you can see on the thing. So they've mm-hmm. gone around the corner, there's the, the corner, and they've come here. Oh, I'll just go forward. Yeah, that's all right. Yeah, that's all right. From here, yeah, it's all right. But if they've gone all the way down the road and it's down here, oh, I'd like to try that again. Or go forward. Why? Yeah, it, it's very much common sense. Norm, normally, they would only go forwards on that manoeuvre if they were too close to the curve, as opposed to yeah. too wide from it. Right, yeah. If they come back and they're, they're going to hit it, then don't wait to hit it or mount it. If they're about to hit it, yeah, the only thing you can do is go forward a little bit. Obviously, check around, because that's just as important. I suppose this is about your pupil... Um, understanding what driving is rather than doing what they think they should be doing, if that makes sense, where they can apply their own common sense to the situation, where they can look at it and rectify it as long as they're going, rather than going, ah. That is at the crux of what last night's webinar was all about, client-centred yeah. learning. Yeah. Everyone to understand it. Yeah. It's giving them empowerment. So if you don't give them empowerment... They make a mistake. You give them empowerment, then they can spot that mistake as they go. Um, Andy Nolan, um, I've got a couple here. One from Andy, one from Peter. Let's get through these. By the way, if you've got a question, I'm gonna, uh, we've got six questions up here. Um, next four questions will we, we'll do um, because you know we, we're now in three quarters into this. Um, Andy Nolan says, pass, fail, none on the DL25 form. What does none mean? A walk back? Mm-hmm. You've got pass, pass, fail, no, none. No, none is when you get a terminated test. Yeah. When you get a what? Yeah, it's a terminated test. Yeah. So it's a walk back. For example, yeah. it's a walk back then. No, no, but a walk back, uh, the reason being uh, maybe a tyre just, you've got a puncture. Not a walk back because you've gone up the curve and you've punctured that tyre. Right. You can't carry on. That was their fault. And that is a. a um, 
you're terminating it in the interest of public safety. Why can't we just call it a BFH? What's a BFH? Bus fare home. Oh. <laughs> you never watched Bullseye, did you? Um, you can't be a bully. Um, I th Peter Russell, I think this is Professor Peter Russell, um, um, if, if I'm not wrong, from the IMTD. Um, if it is, Peter, I, I know who you are. Good evening. Um, are ADI's PDI's results analysed by the DVSA? I'm not sure. I don't know. I think he's looking uniquely there, isn't he, as opposed to... I mean, globally they are, because we understand what the pass rates are. We understand why, you know, people fail. Um, but, I mean, that's more the, uh, that's more the pupil, isn't it? Um, I'm not sure, because sometimes I've been told that, yeah, yeah, we'll fight... Um, we have, uh, we can, like, they don't put their, their numbers in, do they? Their API numbers. So we haven't got that. But then we've got their, their car number, registration, registration yeah. number. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if there is or if there isn't. No. Oh, well, I don't. I, can, I, can yes. I don't want you to answer this one. I'm going to ask you a question to the audience. So please put your, just put a single reply on here. Um, I, I do know the answer because I've researched this. What's the common, what's the most common reason for people failing? So please, what's the most common pe uh, reason for people failing? Put your answer in the chat box. And we'll look at that in a few minutes. I do know the answer because I've looked at it. Um, whoa, there we go. A few coming in here. <laughs> um, Alex, Alex Rux, are the pass rates for individual ADIs recorded? Being a dual language ADI, my pass rate for English speakers is very good. But for people that don't speak English as their native language, it's quite a bit lower. Like I said, I don't know. No, I don't know. Um, lots of people are uh, um, sticking in some questions. Oh, oh, a few minutes. <laughs> Um, Alex says, um, also, do you record the language level of the candidate? That's a good question. Language level? Yeah. What do you mean? No, well, I, I kind of know the answer to this. Um, when you're learning uh, a foreign language, it's graded. Now, the yeah. EU, because you know what they like with their rules and regs, they grade it like A1, A2, A3, B1, B2, B3, and, uh, and so on. I think Alex is relating to that, but that's not the case, is it? Because you've you, you've not learned to teach English as a foreign language no. or anything else. And Graham Smith says I've had pupils ready with 20, 20 lessons and some with one hundred lessons. Um, it would drag on for the good ones. I think he's referring there to um, how many hours it would take yeah. to drive and test. Um, Derek, our mate in Australia, he says here a student can fail the parallel park and still pass the test. Does that apply in the UK or is it a total fail? No, total fail. Total fail, Derek. You see, because you're down under, mate, you've got things upside down. Um, <laughs> uh, Peter Russell says, no, he's not the professor. Um, he says, poor mirror usage. Okay. Ah, right, okay, I understand. So lots of people, I asked the question, what's, yeah. the, what's the biggest reason for failing? And it's interesting, so I've asked this question in this environment. Now, back in February, I was a naughty boy. And on the vision group, I asked the group, I asked everybody in the, in the vision group, what's the biggest reason why people failed? And we had over 100 people answer that question. And 80% of people said nerves. Now, tonight, we're talking about marking the driving test and not one person has said nerves. Now, I know the answer because it's been consecutive for the last 10 years. It's observation at junctions, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And it's talking nerves as in led them to, to that as well. I yeah. don't know. Don't record yeah. nerves, do you? Use for them, you know? DVSA don't record nerves. I mean, it could be a contributing factor, but how do no, you but record on a, on a lesson, how many times, I don't know, how many times do they not look to their right um, coming up to a crossroads and they, they're turning left? How many times do they not look and right with you? Yeah. yeah. This is where we need to, obviously, without getting into the uh, last night's webinar, mm. where we had to make sure that the risk is shared appropriately. Now, so everybody who answered that question and got it wrong, yeah. 
you've got to buy a ticket for the uh, the summit in January. Yeah. And for everybody who, who actually answered it right, you've still got to buy a ticket anyway. Yes. Uh, so Ari Ahmed says, is the examiner allowed to change their decision at the end of the test? No. No, we answered this while he was uh, off somewhere. Getting another bottle of wine, yeah. yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, Peter Sleet. Thanks again, Peter, for your comment tonight. I really appreciate it. Peter, you, you, you put a few up tonight. It's great. If the DVSA looked at my test stats, then could I be giving advice on my standards test? Uh, Nick can't answer that because he's never done standards check. So move yeah. on, please. Okay. Um, Martin, Martin, what's your opinion on that? My opinion? Yeah. Um, I like it, by the way. I... Yeah, but I, I think you're getting into a bit of a minefield because then what you're getting is the DVSA, who are a regulatory, regulatory body, yeah. moving into training. And that, that's not what they're for. So it opens up a, a, a real big can of worms. So I, I'm not in favour of it, I'm afraid. Okay. Some, some lady called Maria Leather, never heard of her, um, evening Maria. <laughs> when you book a test for someone with special education needs, you fill out on the booking form that person's needs and how you help them on lessons so that the examiners know how to help the pupil on the test. At the end of the day, with or without special needs, that person has to be safe when driving alone and not a danger to anyone else. Maria, thanks for that. I think you echo the thoughts of many people on here tonight. And uh, we've, got a, we've got a lot of PDIs on here tonight. We've got a lot of new ADIs tonight. And they don't have your level of experience yet because you've been in this game for quite some time. So I think many people will appreciate what you've just said. Steve Stratford, um, he writes, I find most faults have to be marked on what happens at the time. The examiner uh, can only mark on what happens at the time, along with the, um, you might see something that is a DF, but you as an instructor might see it as an SF. Bit of interpretation there, really, isn't it? Um, I didn't catch the last bit, because yeah. you said DF, uh, it's not, yeah, driver fault and yeah, SF. Right, okay. I yeah, I'll, I'll read it again. I find most faults have to be marked on what happens at the time. The examiner can only mark on what happens at the time. Yeah. Along with what the examiner might see, he might the examiner might see it as a DF, but usually an instructor might see it as an as as an SF. It's it's judgment, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, where would, yeah, but where would the, the instructor see it from? Are we talking about when you're sitting in the back, or well, if you're sitting in the back. You don't know really. Don't. Yeah, it's a different view from the back. It's, if I if I can just pick up, I've, I've noticed a question there from Chris Benson, uh, or it's more of a statement than a question. I love him again. Yeah, I know. He, he says you can request your test results from the DVSA each year, so they, so they obviously do keep records because you can get them if you want them. So right, Mark Wardle wants to give 50 quid to speed of sight. God bless you, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Um, right, okay. Alan Drabble. Uh, thank, wow. uh, even, even, Alan's a Sheffield United fan. Forest beat Sheffield United the other night. Um, well, a couple of weeks ago, 2-1. Even in Alan. Thank you for the three points. No. Alan says, Nick, did the pass certificate have the declaration on it? I will keep up to date with the road and traffic regulations, or is that a myth? Is that what he said? <laughs> That's, he's asking if it was true or is it a myth? So can you repeat that? I'll, I'll... Yeah, he writes, did the pass certificate have the declaration on it? I will keep up to date with the road and traffic regs. I think it has. Is it? I don't know, I haven't seen one for ages. Not that I've taken any test. No. Um, I don't know. No, I don't know. Chris Benstead, by the way, just put the email address on there to get your pass rate report. I'm sure you'd probably have to put your ADI number in there yeah. and you may have to put proof of who you are as well. Um, I don't know, but uh, cheers, Chris. 
Um, Saeed, even if Saeed, Saeed's now in Oxford, um, if a candidate um, has the same examiner several times, can he or she refuse to go with that allocated examiner? No. She can refuse, but she ain't going to take a test. Aha, uh -huh. my cloaky. Yeah, because it's still pot luck, still luck of the draw. Um, Peter Sleep says the standards test is there to help me. It is there to help you, Pete, but it's not really a question for tonight. I understand your question, but it's it's not on the angle where we're going for. Um, Andy Nolan says, so, I mean, this is, Andy, again, we might not be able to answer this, or Martin might have a stab in the dark. Uh, which you might be at the moment, Blackadder too. Um, so an ADI's pass rate doesn't influence when the standards check letter drops onto the doormat. No, it shouldn't do. You know, you. I mean, I'm, I shouldn't talk about this, but no. it's like a normal test, isn't it? Like you. Uh, I've, I've spoken to several standards check examiners, and you will be marked purely on your that particular. Session. Okay. Um, so I'm just getting rid of a few questions that we've said because um, I. Oh, you frozen again, David? Oh, you're back. back. Yeah, we're back in the room. Sorry about that, everybody. Grant's not me. It's not the wine. Um, we're going to draw this to a close in a few minutes anyway. Toby Scott, if a fault happens and not recorded straight away, uh, could the examiner record it as a minor, even if you feel it's a borderline serious at the time? Um, what, later on? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> uh, no, I, I used to I, uh, record it. As it happens. As it happens, but okay. obviously if you're in a situation where you can't take your eyes off the road and, and you mark it down in the next safety little slot that you've got, so you've got a road coming up and there's nothing to go through there. Right. So um, I hear you say you, got, you want to bring it to a close, but... Yeah, give me a second, mate. Um, right. I'm just going to finish this last question off here. If an ADI has got a low pass rate, with the DVS, will the DVSA be calling for a standards check? Oh, I think we just answered that. No. no. Right. That okay. answers all our questions. Right. Let me jump in and do a few thank yous. Okay. Firstly, I want to thank Nick for giving up his time. So thanks, mate. All right. Um, a good cause, isn't it? It's for a great cause and it's for the pass a pound scheme from speed of sight. I want everybody that has watched this to please sign up for it. I put the link is on here now. You've got the link on there. Great. Okay. I'm going to go a little bit further. All right. If you think you have learned something and can take something constructive away from this webinar, we've had over 500 and how many, David, registrants? 565. It's a world right. record. An okay. unofficial world record. Right. What or I'm going to do, as a passionate advocate for speed of sight, I'm going to ask everybody to make a donation of one pound. Yeah, do it. Do it. Make that donation. It, it's on www.speedofsight.org and you can find out how to register for pass a pound. And if everybody that's registered for this also donates one pound, that will cover four persons driving experiences with speed. That's right. Okay, because it's about 130 quid a pop. Paul a counter, put Paul a counter. Paul a carter said, I've already signed up. Does that count? Thanks, Paula. Of course Great, it does. Thank you. Jonathan, I've signed up during this webinar. Jonathan, thanks so much, you're a gent. Mark Dawson, I already signed up while the webinar was going on. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Jonathan said he's also going to pledge a £5 donation. Uh, yeah. That's wonderful. Thanks very, very much. Um, I want you there at the summit. We want you there at the summit because yeah. we want to meet you. Nick, I've got a question for you tonight. Now, now I know that you've got a yacht, and, and I know that... Um, 
Nick the Greek is from obviously France. Um, <laughs> um, Nick's going to put his link on here later on. If anybody's interested in some holidays, then please contact Nick. Um, but Nick, I don't know your diary, but if you would like to attend the summit and be on our panel as your own personal opinion, then I'll get Tina to stick her hand in the pocket and pay for your hotel for the night and I'll pay for your food. But please check your diary of Mrs. Nick the Greek. Brilliant. Okay, smash it. Uh, Harry Ahmed stuck 50 quid in. It's great that you're sticking the money in. I want to see you at the Bleeding Summit. Yeah. Please, uh, everybody, come to the summit. We need to see people at the summit. Um, there's, you, you're just going to come away with so much. There's going to be a lot of people on different panels answering questions. Um, I'm proud to say I'm going to be on one of them answering business questions. Well, and if Nick, you're going to come along, we can I, have a. I, I don't, oh, yeah. It's January the 28th. I'll have a look. Have I'll a look. look. Yeah. We can have an Uzo. Um, I, I want to say thank you to Tina and Kelly at ADND because without them putting their hand in their pocket, we couldn't have done this webinar tonight and Speed of Sight couldn't have benefited so much. So thanks everyone at ADND. Thanks to the, the summit. And on a personal note, I'd like to say thank you to all the admins of all the various forums and groups that I have been a real pain in the arse to over the past yeah. 10 days. I've been bugging them. Let me put this post up. Let me put this post up. Yeah, let me on dash cam. Chris on, uh, on, on the dark side. Hey, yeah. the, are the disability Yeah, thanks to all of you guys. It's made a real difference. And the last thank you really is to the hotel. We're at the Royal Chase Hotel in Enfield and we're in a very nice room, not that you can see it very well, but they donated this room free of charge, which would normally have cost £175. It's not a bedroom, by the way. No, please don't get the wrong idea. It's not a bedroom. Just because he's green, we don't roll that way. Yeah. But, um, no, thank you very much to everyone. And um, I suppose the biggest thank you has to go to everyone that's registered yeah. and watched. Thanks for taking yeah. the time out of your day. We know you've all had busy days as well. I hope this has been a beneficial experience for all of you. And um, keep tuning in to Facebook Live with Martin on a Monday night and we're going to keep trying to do things like this. Hey Martin, I tell you what, Derek, Derek Mikulaj from Australia, he says the summit's too far away, it's 12,000 miles. Hey Derek, I've got some news for you. Sonia Freer, she lives on the Gold Coast, she's booked a flight already, pal. Yeah, come yeah. over. Come uh, over. Jonathan says, thank you chaps. Look, it has been an absolute pleasure. Nick, you've been a star, mate. I really appreciate it. I can't see how many attendees we've got left on here. Of oh, 74. Right. One thing, one more thing. I can't let this go. All right. right. <laughs> Next year, I'm going to change my annual holiday plan um, <laughs> because I'm going to go to Catalonia uh, where Nick, he doesn't run holidays. He does cruises, midnight cruises. So, instead of just retiring, and getting uh, pipe and slippers and watching TV or going playing golf, I <laughs> bought half a share in a cruise boat, uh, 40 tons, three floors, wow. uh, the whole shebang. Got, got me license and everything to drive it, but I'm practicing on that. Right. Uh, but yeah, that's what I do now uh, in the summer. So from April to October, that's where you'll find me. And if you want to see an ex-driving examiner standing on the back of his boat, leading the dancing for oh, YMCA, yeah. That's it. and it's raining yeah. men, okay, go. This is why I'm going, mate. You just had me signed up. Then you mentioned the, the two <laughs> records I despise. Um, no, please. I mean, if, you, if, yeah. if you're interested in holidays in Greece and what have you not, then you know, do get in touch with Nick because Nick's giving his time up tonight, and you know, just have a look. Uh, in the winter, if anyone wants uh, advice on passing their part two to the threes, as it stands now, the test I can help. When it changes, though, um, the, the part three, I, I won't be able to help that. Um, I'm trained up for that. Chris so, Benstead says, pleasure as always. Um, Vicky Tubb, thank you so much for this. Hopefully, I can better prepare pupils now. 
just signed up to pass a pound as well. Oh, Vicky, bless you. Vicky, be at the summit. I want to see you at the summit. I've um, got the link on here. Come on, 17 quid. You know, I talk about the summit, right? And there's lots of conferences. Now, I don't want you to think about CPD as in the CPD square box. It is CPD. But there's industry stuff related there. But this is a day of where it goes further than your driving school. This is about you and what you want in your life and where you want to take your family. Because the people that we put on are world-class speakers. We've got Muppets, like me and Martin. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) But seriously, we've got world-class speakers on that looking at core values, motivation, determination, and what they are going to share with you and you can take away and just put into your life, which will have a massive positive effect on your family if you want it to do so. And it's, it's only 17 quid. And there's a reason why we priced it so low, so everybody can afford it. It's not 60, 70, 80 quid. It's 17 quid. You, if you come in a little bit further away, you can afford to stop in a hotel that night before. So it's a hotel, 50 quid. I mean, most conference tickets in this industry is 50, 60, 70 quid. Then you've got to get your hotel on top. Ours is an, an a 17 quid. If you buy your ticket now, that money goes straight to speed of sight and they can use it straight away. Um, and you are going to have one heck of a time. So and, and I just it. make a challenge to everybody out there. Come yeah. to the summit and if you do not get blown away by the force of nature that is David Heiner. Oh, God. Yeah. And come out of there feeling pumped, feeling like you can do whatever you want to do and take your business, yourself, your family, wherever you want to go, right? I'll give you your 17 quid back. Okay? Really? David, yeah. Heiner, really? David Heiner is worth the price of admission on his own. Look, I'll tell you something about David Heiner, right? He is the most sought after speaker in the education industry. He speaks to somewhere between 10 and 50,000 school children a year. This guy takes people from E and F grades to B and A grades. And that's in the education industry. Then in the professional industry, he works with big senior directors today. I'm not going to tell you how much money he earns a day for his speaking, but let's put it this way. Barclays hire him for their staff. Spec savers hire him for their staff. And we've got him for nothing. And then we've got Cool Mahay. Cool Mahay spent 30 years in the Derbyshire Constabulary and he left as a temporary um, superintendent. That might not tell you much at the moment, but what he does, he talks about core values and takes you that extra stretch. And someone's just put written on here, Jonathan, I've just checked the link, you've got Cool Mahay speaking, oh my God. Um, yeah, he's on the same shift as you, was he? He's pretty convincing speaker. Jonathan, what a small world. He actually used to date a girl in Pinkston. I grew up in Pinkston. That's another small world. But what Cool Mahay is going to do, he, he's just, so many people are knocking on his door right now. Big ticket people paying thousands of pounds to see Cool and to see David. And we have got them for free. So you'll be crazy not to go because the information that they've got, and they're not going to stand up there and just do a sales pitch to you. They're going to stand up there and give you their heart and soul. And, and Martin, if you're saying to people, if you don't think it's worth it, once you've been there, you'll pay your 17 quid back. I'm going to stick that on every piece of advertising going. I know, I know what's going to happen at the summit. And I know that, if people are being honest and truthful with themselves, it is absolutely impossible for them to walk out at the end of the summit yeah. without taking something positive that they can apply to their life or my own personal favourite, their business. What I've done for the last two years, I've asked all instructors to bring their own question. This is a summit. It's a place to talk. It's not a conference when you're being spoken at. It's a place for you to engage. So I want you to look at your life and look at your business and think, what's my challenge? What do I want to do? 
and, 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 and create the question from that. Even if you're driving up on the way, I want you to think about that question. And then we are, we're not just bringing in any trade stands. Some trade stands we've politely said no to because it's not suited the event. And I, I don't want to be wrong to the trade stands. We're bringing the specific trade stands and they're prepared for this. But you can speak to any trade stand and not ask them why you should buy from them. But you should go to that trade stand and say, hey, you know what? This is my question. How can you best help me with that? This is my question. What do you believe in that? And in the last two years, the, the feedback has been awesome because of the networking. And then the presenters are there to help you as well. And then we've got two panels happening, so you can ask questions through the panels. And then what's happened after the event is people are still firing questions in to the trade stands and to the presenters. And the presenters are still an answering questions two and three months after because we're helping you all for 17 quid. And that money goes to speed of sight. So you're helping people with disability to have that beautiful chance of driving. And Julie Bunsen says, just bought my ticket. Well done, Julie. And speaking to someone that has got a uh, trade stand at the summit, I can reinforce what you just said. You know, I'm not going there to sell to people. I'm going with go there to engage with people that I have engaged with a lot online and on Facebook. And I just want to meet everyone. Come up. See me, please. Ask me any questions you want. I do what I do because I love doing it. Come and say hello. Let's get your questions answered. You are echoing every trade stand because I said to trade stands, look, bring your wares. Let people investigate to find out who you are, what you do, and how you can help better their business. But do not sell to people. No. Speak to them. Ask them what their question is. And if you don't have the answer, pass them on to somebody. And to let you all know, by the way, at about half past seven in the morning before the ADIs come in, I get all the trade stands in a huddle because some people know each other and some people don't. And we find out where our expertise lie. So let's say, uh, well, I know where Martin's expertise lies, business development, but you might have a question on whatever, and you go to Martin, and Martin will can say to you, look, I can give you this opinion of it, but the person, the trade stand that you need to speak to today is X, Y, Z, because we're all there working for a team, and really, it's all for us. And please, if you're buying a ticket, bring an ADI friend along with you. Get them to come along with you. Badger your association. Tell them about it, and, and come along, and, and, and just embrace the occasion, and... Go where you want to be. We're all born equal, you know. We're all born here for a purpose. Um, and it's up for you to decide on how you want your life to go. And I'm in the process of, of doing that right now and have been for a while. And I know a lot of you are on the same page as me. This is not just a job. This is more than being a driving instructor. The bottom line is driver safety that's why you're an adi everything that we should do in this industry is all about driver safety and the summit completely supports that but beyond driver safety there's you there's your hopes yours your dreams yours your aspirations and there's the family that you support as well so when you come along to the summit you'll get that brilliant paula carter's just bought her ticket paula get back online buy a second one <laughs> Jonathan says he's got to go. Thank you so much. Um, Raf is it Raphael or Raphael? Raphael? Thanks, guys. I'll put, um, I'll put some money for sure. Great webinar. Big hello from Swindon. Um, thanks, Raphael. Really, really good of you. Yeah. Um, I'm going to say goodbye, but really I think the last people that should say goodbye are Nick and Martin before you do John Grayson has just said money's donated thank you John Grayson thank you. Um, there's a few people on here saying um, Graham Smith he's donated his automatic CPD certificate if you have made a donation yeah just let Martin know yeah. Martin what's um, it's Martin that's writing private development dot co dot uk what I'm going to do in your email, I will put this information in the email so you'll receive that and, we'll, and Martin will also put it on vision. Um, 
Thank you so much. Julie Bunting, looking forward to it. Thanks for another great webinar. Lynn Atkinson, good night. Good night. Thanks. Money's over. Cheers. Okay, one last thing. Just as a favour to me, can you put um, the link to Nick's uh, website up for his cruises? What is it? It's www.kepeloniacruise.com. Friggin' now. All right, how do I spell that? <laughs> K E F F A L O N I A and then Cruz. C R U I. Cephalonia is Kilo, Echo, Foxtrot, Alpha, Lima, Oscar, November, India, Alpha. Correct. That's it. See, cruise dot, did you say dot com? Yeah. Go on then have a little look. We've got a Facebook page as well where we put all that stupid stuff. Me dancing and stuff. Wow, well, I'm just on Facebook. People are, um, people are saying I've just donated and stuff like that. Thank you so much. Um, Nick, if we get to see you in January, I know you're busy, you're retired now. Yeah. Um, if we get to see you in January, You've got a room, you've got food paid for, you, you're very, very well done, we'd love, to, we'd love to have you. And, and just everybody remember that for years we had them and us type of thing, you know, the instructors didn't, didn't trust the examiners, and the, you know, and it, not yeah. all the no, <laughs> there was a lot of it about. And, um, and now I can say this, I can talk my mind, because I wasn't allowed to before, because I worked for the agency. And, you know, it, it really isn't. All you've got to do is just get your candidates to drive up to the, the level, you know, a safe level, and instead of getting them up to that, get them a little bit more to allow for nerves. And we're all in it for the same thing. We want pe safe people on the roads, don't we? That's Absolutely. it. There's nothing else. No ulterior motives. That is it. Um, Andy, Andy, um, Andy Nolan's asking where are the summit details. Andy, I'm just sticking them in the check box in, in in the box, and I'm just putting them on um, on Facebook as well. Um, Jonathan Daniels or Jonathan Daniels Beauty because he married again. Um, he wrote that. Uh, I'll pass that on to Cull. Look, I've got Cull on my friends list, so if you're on Facebook, add me. And uh, I can put you in touch with Cully if you want to. I'm sure I'd be delighted to have a chat to you. Just, I won't pronounce this right. Is it Jocelyn or Joycelyn? Joycelyn Lewis. What time does the summit start? Well, it's actually in Mansfield. I I've not actually really got a start time yet. <laughs> It'd be about nine o'clock, yeah. um, nine half past. Sorry, I know, I know Joycelyn. I'll, I'll be talking to her soon. I can... is, she, is she based your way? Yeah, she's actually coming um, on one of the business development courses soon. Oh, lovely. Well, you know, yeah. chuck in the car, chuck in the boot. Um, and <laughs> so chuck in the boot. John Grayson says, thank you very much. Um, Ari Damid, he's put 50 quid in. Oh, mate. Brilliant. That's free tickets, Ari. Yeah. And there's, there's one more thank you I've forgotten, because if I don't, I'm never going to get fed again. All right. <laughs> Maria, by the way. Thank you so much because she's the one that's going to end up doing nearly 500 CPD certificates. Not well, I think you should say that because Graham Smith says, is it an automatic CPD certificate? No, it's not. You've no. got to either email Martin yeah. or get Martin on Facebook. So what I'm going to do very quickly before we all bugger off is I'm going to put Martin's link on Facebook. Um, to you all right now so you're gonna have to copy and paste this good night Kevin Kevin Winship says good night yep. there, there is uh, <laughs> Martin's Facebook thing we do dar so copy and paste that and um, get in touch with Martin but I will drop his email address in there and stuff like that yep. what a night Martin what a night Nick it's, it's been brilliant and um, just Moving on and expanding on what we were talking about, the, the summit, and about it's just about engaging with people. Yeah. You know, I feel quite blessed. Six, seven months ago, I had nine Facebook friends. 
I've got over 2,000 now. Right? And if anybody's watched this tonight that isn't the Facebook friend, please send me a friend request and any business related questions for your driving school business, I'll be more than happy to answer them always. Yeah, likewise. I've got 3,600 friends, uh, so I'm boasting. My penis is bigger than your sort of thing. <laughs> Pam West, good night and thanks for your time. Good night, Pam. Good night, Toby. Good night. Yeah. Good night, everyone from my end. I'll get things sorted. We'll get a recording over to to all to you all tomorrow. Nick, thank you. Martin for arranging this. Brilliant. Finally, Tina and Kelly at AD and D. You putting your hand in your pocket quite yeah. deep. Um, so thanks tonight. You all owe me a cognac. Well, I owe Tina a cognac, definitely. Mate, if you owe Tina a cognac, you might as well take the bucket to pour it in it. Yeah, I, I know, I know. <laughs> I'm going well. to end this now. Um, I'll, drop, I'll, I'll quickly say hello to you on Facebook in a second, Martin. Okay. I'll give you a live call. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thanks for watching. Thank you.